morning. I'm Ramesh Mulimani, working as a superintendent archaeologist in Archaeological Survey of India. I'm holding the charge of Priest Branch Nagpur and a newly started rock art study unit in Nagpur, Priest Branch. So both I'm holding the charge right now. And today's modern, this session, morning session, there are six, I mean, speakers are here. Then now I would like to request you, please stick on to time and be remembered. If time permits, we will give for uh, a discussion part of it. Okay, now the uh, first speaker is Mr. <coughs> Dr. R. Mohana. Please come on the dais. Mr. Mohan. Mohana. And Mohana is not ready. And uh, I request Professor Murgeshi T. Murgeshi, are you ready? Please come. Dr. Mohan, आइए। अच्छा आप ही को खोज रहे कहीं पहाड़ में गुजर गए क्या कहीं हुए इधर उधर जा रहे भटक रहे पता नहीं चल रहा है। Dr. Sir, thank you. हाँ, please stick with the time, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Mohana R., Assistant Professor in the Department of Ancient History, Culture and Archaeology, University of Allahabad. Before going my presentation, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to the excursion come conference on Juglis of Konkan. So it is my privilege to <coughs> present my paper here. So in front of my, most of my teachers, the mentors and academic friends are present here. So before the presentation, I would like to say that to take this particular, this topic, the convener of the conference, Mr. Hemandalvi, asking me to prepare particularly on semiotics and cognitive development in the paleo art. So there was no, there was no word to say no for Mr. Eman. So I, I was given my consent, but after that it came to m my mind whether I am able to do it, because this is the strangeable topics or the concept that is cognitive and neurology. Then so after the consent, there was no option for me. So my mind was taken command on that. It was started thinking. It was started functioning. It started resolving the things. It started remembering. I'm engaging in the field of proper art from a decade. It started remembering what you have done. It's already fiddled many of the GB in the mind, then stick into the attention. 
and it started functioning this uh, made frame it structured what can i going to present today so after the structured so i was not started immediate, immediately to make the ppt so later it was given command to the hand to the prepare ppt that is that was before i start journey from allahabad to the goa prior to 3 days so is executing that i brought this ppt that mind how it was structured so i am going to present here that is semiotics and cognitive development in the paleo art of rock art so i would like to begin with the words of professor louis binford who is a well known figure in the field of archaeology as well as in the field of anthropology he is that our knowledge of the past is only good as our knowledge of the present so before i'm going to stick into this uh, semiotics and cognitive development i like to give the brief my research background so you can see here so there are 87 painted rock shelter from 32 sites in the malaparva basin as part of my doctoral research you can see here the depiction of number of species most of these species is completely extinct from this region the professor sate here is help us to the help us to understanding the paleo climate landscape and environment so i am not going going to touch upon because i want to stick into this cognitive <coughs> aspect so then continuation of this you can see here 283 painted rock shelters boulders found in the seven hills range on the left bank of the tungabhadra valley so is within the 9 km radius you can see that you can see the i made quantity analysis that is found 4075 pictures in over 1250 cuples so dr sp water is here sir i trained under you in the 2011 toll session in atikoda you put lot of effort at the dedication for the bimbetka the getting the title of the unesco world heritage so i request i think this is my press first presentation in your presence so i would like to hear your comments on particular this seven hill signs i am calling it means i designated as a bimbetka of south india again i am not going to touch up on this discoveries so you can see here apart from this doctoral and post doctoral reasons i worked in the Raichur do then i am from central karnataka i focused in the central karnataka before i started journey in the field of rock art in 2011 is known only already 80 sites now is reach, reaching 270 sites i am saying this is the richest rock art state at the present based on the data so this is the brief introduction of my research background so here yes yeah, part of doctoral and post doctoral is more than 5000 pictures and uh, i surveyed in the rochur do and in the central karnataka is nearly having more than 7000 pictures but 
touch upon this semiotics and cognitive development in the paleoart of Karnataka, I will go with some of the pictures as an example. So, we there you can see there the unusual painting in Karnataka, not even in Indian support in it. So, this painting what indicates because we are to the so thus I was given the introduction about the my mind. You should understand the post mind, what they were thinking. So you have to understand their cognition through depictions, the conscious intellectual activities, thinking, resonance. This painting, there are you can see the three phases they depicted is superimposed. The first phase is that so Rombai designs are following with the animals and the last phase is the you can see the roughly shaped trapezium containing eleven dots. So I am talking particularly this uh, last phase of this uh, roughly shaped trapezium. So five dots are at upper zone, fire in the middle zone, one is touched in the bottom zone. What it is corresponding? This roughly trapezium is indicating the deep Oshu valley of the Areguda. It is 11 kilometer north of the Bodami. So this painting is drawn in the shelter, shelter called Anepadi. It is very interesting to notice that all these shelters having the local names that is Anepadi, Jumjumpadi, Padiyamapadi, Chikparevalapadi, Bhagupadi, Andarpadi, Karadigavi and so on. So you are slightly we can Rotate this painting. So these dots are the indicating the location of the shelters. So therefore, interpreted as this might be is or could be the oldest map, not only in the world, because limitation of my knowledge, I am not come across such examples. One thing I like to say that. So Mr. Dalvi and myself, we done drone survey of this particular site and we tried for the 3D models of some of the shelters. We are getting all the supporting for this particular, that work is in progress, I could not show that here. So then, what is another special or the characteristic features of this particular painting? You can see that I told you this is in three phase, superimposed. But I use translucent method. Today we are talking about the graphics, we are talking about the other surfaces. How that cognition was developed. So we can observe, we can closely see that, you can see that is what behind the superimposition in the three layers. So how we can understand conscious, intellectual, of the author of this painting. This is another example to understand the cognition development. So then, in the previous, having this particular the deer, you can see that this is the dynamic display of the speed of a galloping. So we can, front legs are lifted up, and backwards. How this so simple drawing is having a lot of meaning. The speed of a galloping in the, in the presentation. He understand the conscious of their intellectual to this painting. The another one I got from the Bimbetka as a reference. So then another feature. The rhombite design or the early abstract and schematic 
in the, especially in the Malaprabha basin, I found in pictograph as well as engraving. And another example we are having, Professor V. S. Sonawale was discovered from Chandravati, Rajasthan, upper Paleolithic core. What this said to be result of earliest attempt of prehistoric people towards schematization. Even this continuation, we can see this form of this rhomboid spiral designs in the form of rangoli, the carved and doors, and in the temple architecture. Then, this is another best example to understand the, their conscious. This is one of the biggest, early largest painted ceilings in India. So measured 11 meter long and 7 meter wide. When you are looking at this painting, there are numerous lines haphazardly uh, scattered all over the ceiling from one end to the another, from top to the bottom. So earlier scholars were interpreted as a met me net or the web. But when I was using the advanced Tracing method of the line drawing. I will go at the end. What what is the advanced tracing method? There are 19 animals, wild animals are depicted. That is the bison, wild goat, then the wild cattle, all that. So this is uh, rhino. I think uh, with my limitation, I think this is the only rhino depiction in South of Pele art. We can see particular, I'm, talk, no, I'm not going to talk about the species, I'm talking about the, there are six squares in two rows in different dimension is the indication thick skin of the animal. You can, another example of the conscious of intellectual. Mm -hmm. Then we are talk, today talking about the x-rays and all that. How that cognition is developed in the human mind. So how he presented that you can see that internal part he was showing, I think he wanted to show the nervous system, how he was connecting to the na nature, how he was connected to the ecology, and others they are showing in the pregnancy. I am going to let us speed up. And you can see the rhino, uh, the taina is very right depictions. You can see that aesthetic here. So another, the example, that this is very, common thing or usual thing in the human life or the many, most of the species that is a childbirth. You can see that conscious, how they shown in the stomach or after getting the delivery. So we are lot of the materials you are getting. This, you can see that passage in the shelter and we are having the water resources in particular the shelter. So because of that, it could be maternity center by the time, because I found triple one nine human figures, particular this reason, this could be maternity center by the time. So this is, when you're talking about the aesthetic, talking in the rock, uh, art, sculptures, iconography, paintings, you can see that the concerned animals, with a long neck, long, uh, uh, this neck and uh, legs. One is turned back and another is looking forward. This is the deer and even the peacock. You can see how you can understand the aesthetic. To, you can see the continuation of that conscious even today. So this is another depiction that is the endless knot design. We are getting the Mahenja Dora that is copper top blade. And Professor Sundara started Noticing in the Karnataka, we are getting 19th century inscription that particularly I also discovered this uh, from the Tungabhadra Valley that is 6 knot design. We are getting the so uh, Telagavi discovered in the Chitadurga, we are getting in the coastal Karnataka. How this is a vice versa is the Neolithic context or into the Harappan civilization. So, even to this continuation of this particular depiction. So this, I'm coming to the human figures, how this are helping us to the understand the indigenous identification, these human figures. So you can see the 
anatomy is not affected. That is the rounded eyes, beard, hair, and noteworthy feature is that uh, elegant torso because of that. So this kind of human figure is not found so far elsewhere because of that. I designated as a prehistoric Badami style of human figures. These human figures are not the, sorry, associate with the wild animals like boar, uh, then the wild boar, rhinoceros, all that. So this is another noteworthy feature. Then the, this is the Seminilis range. You can see the different form of this. This we are taken from the uh, Vindian Ridge and the Lines Stone book. So then I will be coming to this at the end of the topic. So I'm not taking much time. Whether these uh, young free land rings are to the scale or accurate, that is the question. He is one of my friends, the professional, an artist. So when I joined Deccan College in 2011, so I've gone through many of the publications, I got inspired by the senior scholars to, okay, I want to produce these free online drawings for my thesis. Then I called him, accepted, we spent nearly 45 days at the site. So I was so happy. I returned back to the Deccan College where I was completed my doctoral research. But that happiness was not there for a long time. So when I was started giving the scale for this free and run times, I noticed that it's not to the scale, not to the accurate. I completely disappointed. So <coughs> Mr. Dalvi was there. He was there in Nanded by that time. I switched off my mobile. So there was only thing that I, I can cry. So then he called I my mom for the get contact to back, I went to Nanded. So there is a, you can find the solution. The Dr. S.P. Water thought that. You'll find solution for everything. Then I contacted most of my friends who are in good in the computer science and all that. I got the solution within a three months. That, I will we'll see that. This shown in the frame that is the free online drawing. You can see these are the figures are missing from the eye copy. I thought that I choose an wrong artist. So then you can see the perfection of between the free and uh, drawing and you can see the difference between free and low and drawing and the advanced stressing method using the softwares, applications. I'm not going to detail about this. <coughs> then I thought that okay it's wrong with my artist, I've taken wrong person to the field. Then I gone to the library, I searching the published material, I noticed that none of the, sorry to say this, none of the free and line drawings are not to the scale, not to the accurate. What I noticed, you can see this is taken from the Leicester book. There are 39 figures, sorry, there are 69 figures in this painting, but shown here only 30 pictures, 39 figures are missing from this panel. So how we can go to the interpret? How we can understand? The, nowadays, most of the works, thesis are coming on this secondary data, talking about the cognitive con content and all that. So then, so we can see the the elegant touch of the torso of the human figure. I'm not also going with this, and I'm going especially this. You can see that the when you are high copy, it's like a domesticated on animals. So it's missing all world features. World features just we have the aggressiveness. It's not easy to go closer to them. That features is completely missing from the high copies. So these are the things I've noticed, especially here. This another taken again lines and stone. These are the missing figure. Again, you have to see that. Author of the painting, you have to understand is conscious of intellectualness. What you want to say that? You wanted to depict the bison or Indian goat, but here we can say this may animal. We don't know what is this animal when you are talking about this free and loyal ranks. So while copying, you are uh, miss that content. How we can understand is conscious of cognition.
and the neurological aspect. So this is all my presentation. Before that, uh, this I cannot complete this. Today I'm standing on this podium. All my teachers, Professor Shushmadev, Professor Sundara, and uh, Dr. S. P. Vota here, Professor Ravi Korishetar, and I cannot forget all. They helped me a lot with Professor Shila Mishra, Professor G. L. Badam. He is no more. He was helping me a lot to identify this fauna in the heart. <coughs> so that's without paisa ka baat hai, paisa ka bada baat hai. So without money, I cannot, I could not complete this work. So uh, thanks to ICHR and UGC. So th thank, thank you, you. Mr. <laughs> thank you so much, Mohana. Only one question, because he take the time more. So one question, please. See, this is, this is not free and learn time. So we are using uh, certain uh, application like AutoCAD. We can make it. We can do it on Illustrator. We can do it to Photoshop also. So I mean, it is, it is again somebody who has seen, at, who is looking at the images and is trying to extract the figures, right? There are no object detection or those kind of algorithms that are run on these images. Yes. We can get all the figures even if that's not visible in the naked eye. Then you go for the illustrator or any of these things, you trace it. You get the perfect one. Anyone? One more question can be allowed. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mohan. Thank sir. you. Please, please, please. Your apka to banta hai. Actually, I want to say that uh, what the Erwin Neumer has uh, made the copies, or the Wakankar made the copies. At that time, they did their best. The sources available to them at present. So. In spite of criticizing the things, oh, okay, there are, lacu there are lacuna. So what we are doing at present, after 20 years, 50 years, who knows, so much advanced technology will come and there will be lacuna in, in also. So we must appreciate whatever they have done and we must also appreciate what you have done. This spirit should continue. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, I'm not blaming. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mohana. Thank you, sir. One more small addition. Yes, sir. What he shown in, because Badami is my native, because I'm born and brought up with that, sir. And you never, you never forget that Sundra, sir, has been started in the beginning. Whatever you have been shown, most of the Badami rock painting, he only beginner. Later on, so many scholars came and then they made it. You sir, put the technology limit in that way. So, sir, I, um, sir, ha, ha. absolutely, sir. But bolna chahiye na, sir. Sir, sir, let me. Abhi bolne se pata sir, sir, I'm here not talking about the historiography of rock art. Theke, so even bol the time, my addition bol diya. Even the lockdown mein. One minute, one minute. My addition bol diya. Ap isko le. Yes, sir. Thank you. Khatam. But it's stop. Uh, thank you. To this cognitive. Thank you, please. And next, Professor Murgeji, uh, he's retired from the Udupi College and uh, well-known scholar, please. You will take more time, you will be able to finish your discussion. You will see it, you will do your Okay. 
Hello, good morning to all. Respected Chair, Mr. Mulimani, respected teachers, Dr. Ravi Korishetar, Dr. Girajji, Dr. S.P. Wataji, and other seniors and junior fellows. I am thankful to Dr. Tejas Garge, Hemant Dalvi, and all other stakeholders to giving me an opportunity to introduce here today. Geoglyphs of uh, coastal Karnataka and new findings of Goa, Sindhu Durga in Maharashtra. It is a joint paper of Murgeshi, Rajendra Kerkar, Shreyas Bantakal, Manasa Murgesh and Vithal Shalke from Goa. The coastal Karnataka is a small tract laying between Sahadri mountain ranges on the east and Arabian Sea to its west. It is consisted at present three districts like North Kendra having Karwar as its headquarters, Udupi and South Kendra. It has a Konkan to the north and Malabar to the south. It was called as Aparanta in Puranas according to Dr. Govinda Pai and Dr. B.S. Salitur and Guraj Bhatt and other scholars. Huyen Song, a Chinese traveler, visited Vanavasi, present Vanavasi, as a Konkanpura uh, in his uh, travel diary. The Vanavasi is the then imperial capital of the Kadambas, so it was a part of the Konkan region from centuries. Karn Coastal Karnataka has its own cultural entity than the rest of India in several aspects like Bhuta Radhane, that is Kolas, and Naga Radhane, and the matriarchal family system. Since then, the Fawcett pioneering work uh, in South India at Kupgal and uh, Edakkal record sites, a vacuum created more than a century. Thanks to Dr. Gurraj Bhatt, Dr. Sundara and H.R. Ragnath Bhatt, who fill up the gap by discovering Basururu, Bole and Sonda rocket sites in 1970s at Udupi and North Kendra. It was carried on by Dr. Vasant Shetty in Udupi and Shirodkar in Goa by discovering significant rocket sites at Gavali and Pansaimol in 1980s and 90s. In continuation of the work, myself and my team has been able to make a significant discoveries at Buddhana Jeddu in 2009, Avalakki Pare in 2019, and Atur Kundaje in 2022 from Udupi and South Kendra respectively. See, it is a general view of uh, the Buddhana Jeddu, uh, so, sorry, Avalakki Pare record site. So, the laterite plane known as Pare in Canada, the same word used as Sada in Marathi. So Sada is nothing but Pare in Canada. The Buddha Jeddu and Avalaki Pare sites located in a vast open air plains covered by dense forest. Avalaki Pare record site lies in the wildlife forest, whereas Buddha Najedu in reserve forest. So because of that, they are safe, much safe, uh, comparatively the other sites. The figurative figures of all these sites includes the human figures and animal uh, animals drawn in double lines. Abstract and geometric Geometrical designs includes spirals, triangles, circles, square grids 
and other motives. The cup marks found in uh, in, in individuals, groups, and in bilineal pattern. Yes. The first human figure. So this is uh, the first human figure discovered in uh, 2009 at uh, Budhanjadu. The site properly known as uh, called as Bimanapare. Bimanapare in Budhanjadu. So it was the first figure discovered in 2009. It is in the site profile in double line, uh, and all other details I given in my paper. And then. Next figure, it is a very interesting uh, figure, uh, the ice assel, a roughly ice assel uh, uh, filled with uh, different uh, uh, spirals and a double line horizontal bar is there and above that horizontal bar the bull is standing. So next, next one is uh, the peacock. It is found elsewhere in the rock art and petroglyphs. So then, next figure, please. Ah, they are abstract and geometrical designs. And very curiously, uh, see the a grid of squares. And the left side is a eight armed and spoked with bulbs at the end is uh, can be seen and this pattern was elsewhere found on Harappan pottery. Next please. See this is humpless uh, cattle with uh, oval type horns uh, beautifully executed in double lines from Buddhan Jeddu. Next please. See the deer turned back is snout uh, a perfect uh, uh, figure it was 4 into 4 centimeter in width and length from Buddhanjetu. Next, please. So, this is uh, also a very interesting uh, uh, engraving found in Buddhanjetu. See, at the end, uh, please, at the end, two spirals and also a double line uh, horizontal bar is found. It may be a a cart, but locally called as Bandi. Hmm? Next, please. So it is again uh, in Buddha Nijadu, uh, as many as thirty-six pairs of uh, footprints spread all over the site. Next, please. So this is another uh, interesting uh, spiral. Uh, uh, found in uh, Buddha Nijidu with a deep uh, cupel. Next. So next we come to Avalakki Pare. It was uh, discovered in uh, 2019, February 17. See a human figure shown here stretching his hands and appears to be holding bow on his left hand and something like arrow in his right hand. It has round head and has a cup mark on the right side of its belly. On the right side of the head, uh, one more oval shaped cup mark is seen distinctively. It is about 1.80 meters in height and 1.80 meters in width. This figure is comparable with that of a rock painting found in Madhya Pradesh and of course in a few other uh, sites also. Next please. So this is uh, another human figure has uh, a distinctive headgear. Distinctive headgear. Next please. See, this is another uh, uh, human figure with different style of standing. So, in earlier figure, the hands are stretching and legs are also stretching. But here, it is uh, uh, a straight uh, uh, standing position, uh, uh, this particular figure is shown. Next. See, it is uh, very difficult to identify. Uh, is it baby elephant, I ask you? <laughs> huh? So many scholars identified in different way, uh, it is left to you. Thank you.
next so it is a general view of the human figures see from the above the ground uh, the this avalokya uh, pare figures uh, looking uh, stand in a circle but from uh, the standpoint from the surface it is difficult to see in this thing please next please so it is it is another close up of the uh, human uh, figure and this particular human figure has a round head next please so it is a, a cylindrical laterite for uh, laterite uh, formation with four cup marks at the center uh, and uh, two on either sides they are little big it is an archaic form of chenne mane chenne mane is a popular game uh, very commonly found in uh, coastal karnataka this coastal karnataka was known as tulu nadu historically it is known as uh, tulu nadu and even in uh, rashtrakuta inscription it is uh, uh, referred as alwa keda alwa keda it was ruled by alu pass that is why it was called alwa keda so the present day chennai mane has the 14 uh, bilinear uh, pattern but it is archaic form i think it is archaic form it is a small four uh, cupels and bigger uh, two big uh, either side of, uh, of that uh, cylinder so it is uh, and it is also found in uh, not only in south india it is also uh, found in africa as mankala next please so a core found in the site avalokya pare site next ah uh, we come to the goa southern goa a kind of graffiti marks found in uh, gokul dam village of uh, kupam taluk of south goa see all these uh, whatever i now showing from goa they are all discovered by dr rajendra kerkar a well known uh, activist <coughs> of goa okay Hmm? Yes. Next, please. See, this is again record of Pirla. It was nowhere recorded uh, for the first time uh, with the kind permission of uh, Dr. Rajendra Kerkar. I show here uh, in uh, Kupam Taluk of South Goa two human figures with a bull. See, these human figures are comparable with that of Avalokya Pare in uh, some respects. Next, please. See the rock art in Kajur village of Kupam Taluk in South Goa. Crowd of deer on stone boulder. So next, please. See, it is actually uh, patils are shown yesterday. Rock art of Virdi village in uh, Dodmar Taluk of uh, Shindurga district of Maharashtra. It was discovered uh, by Rajendra Kerkar more than ten years ago. please uh, patil sahab uh, please make it uh, note ha huh? okay okay next please ah yeah sir yeah sir yeah uh, yeah i know okay so neolithic uh, ring stones found in uh, revam of uh, satari taluk in nard goa uh, the three ring stones are found there they are of course belongs to uh, late uh, neolithic or megalithic uh, period next so it is one more cupel in mousi village of uh, satari taluk in north goa district next please so it is already shown uh, yesterday rock art of mousi village of satari taluk in north goa district of goa the jebu will see the double line next please see this is the same picture after cleaning uh, the boulder okay next please see it is again uh, mousi uh, figures the bulls are fighting and two other bulls shown in the uh, lower part next please so this is another interesting figure found in uh, uh, mousi uh, in uh, bruising style next please oh okay thank you all thank you for giving uh, an opportunity thank you murgesh ji thank you so much any question please
Ah, please. Ah, Avalaki Pare and Buddha Nejedu are on a laterite plane. Okay. So, any differences that you see because of the material? Materials? No, I mean because of basalt and laterite, do you see any differences in the carvings in these two? No, all the figures depicted only on laterite. Ah, yeah, stylistic variation is there. Okay. Okay, Konkan uh, figures are uh, totally different uh, than uh, the coastal uh, depictions in a style and also pattern. Any question, please? Thank you, Professor Murgeshi. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, one and all. And man, next speaker is Professor Ravi Kori Shatarji, he is my guru and uh, you know very well and still in this days he is roaming here and there for uh, doing a lot of <laughs> work. <laughs> I have come to Konkan, not anywhere else. Thank you, sir. Sorry. Thank you. Namaste, everybody. Uh, yes, uh, rethinking Sangana Kalu rock art. Um, emphasis on rethinking and also on Sangana Kalu. Uh, although the topic given to me uh, was somewhat general in terms of the region of Karnataka, my predecessors have done that job already. So I would like to emphasize more on what is my experience rock art at Sangana Kalu. And also rethinking in the sense, uh, I think there is no end to rethinking about the way we understand, the way we have been interpreting uh, the meaning of rock art since they were first discovered and they came into the domain of archaeologists. So that is what I think. Uh, this is an endless activity as long as we are not very sure who produced it, when was it produced, how was it produced, who were the persons responsible for this production, and what was the role of uh, productivity of the landscape in the production, in the way in which rock art has been produced across the landscapes over a vast area? It's not only in particular one particular region, but elsewhere. And then uh, rethinking is going on with respect to Sanganakalu rock art bodies, uh, because this is one of the most uh, investigated archaeological site anywhere in India. The site was first discovered in 1860s, and since then, various cultural features associated with distinctive landforms across this particular landscape have been noticed, uh, documented, and also described mostly. Uh, in terms of interpretation and in chronology, there have been a series of problems because there's a lot of superimposition. Although now we have a very good uh, time control in terms of the time period when it was produced, uh, does not seem to be older than about 2100 BC and then the upper limit being uh, about 1000 BC or so. So during this time period, there was an intensity of human activity with some breaks now and then, but this was, you see that there is a lot of uh, um, intensity of activity ranging in time from the late phase of the Neolithic, because um, we do see that the Neolithic phase in Southern India, especially in this part of uh, mid-Southern Deccan, associated with uh, Tor Inselberg uh, granitic landscapes, um, <clears throat> that the expansion of uh, pastoral uh, communities into this region was relatively later than that it happened further north in the Deccan region as well. So what we see is that pastoralism was an introduction to this area, and once these people moved into this area, they were able to adapt to these local conditions and emerge as an early you know, agricultural economy. And uh, this particular transition, we uh, witnessed changes in the landscape, uh, both natural as well as cultural landscape, and that has been so very well documented. The first person to noti notice this site was a civil engineer by one William Fraser, 
uh, based in Bellary, this, this colonial times, there were these people very, very active in exploring the interior parts of the region where they were working. And he was the one who brought Robert Brucefoot to this site. And that is where the era of identification of this particular site uh, begins. And Foot was the first to, to recognize this as a Neolithic site. In addition to that, he also said this was a major stone axe manufacturing center, and that too of the Neolithic period. And also, he was able to identify, being a geologist, he knew what is local and what is exotic and what was introduced into this area. So within a radius of about 15 to 30, uh, 20 kilometers, he could identify multiple resources, especially raw material, lithic resources, which were brought to the site, and then they were modified into various types of artifacts and so on. And uh, since then, um, the rock art also came to be uh, identified. And in the late 19th century, we begin to see uh, notices published in um, early uh, journals, which were published in England and so on. And Fawcett happens to be the first person who noticed, uh, described the rock art here. Prior to that, Robert Sewell also was responsible for uh, bringing to light the presence of uh, uh, what we call Neolithic art, popularly known as Neolithic rock bruising and so on. Uh, but yet, uh, um, <coughs> the rock art remained a secondary aspect of archaeological research here. And there used to be breaks in the way in which these uh, investigations were carried out at Sangankalo. Um, as I said, 1860s to 2023 is more than 170 years or so. And my association with this particular landscape, especially the rock art body, uh, that has been documented here uh, is at least 25 to 27 years or so. So rethinking happens to be uh, an essential aspect of archaeological research, especially when we look at uh, this kind of rock art body, which has series of superimpositions. So if there were, you know, uh, lateral uh, features, you know, uh, showing as a sequence in terms of chronology, it could have been much easier to understand why it was produced, when it was produced, and who were the people who were responsible for this production, and so on and so forth. Yet, um, there have been attempts, and all that has been uh, you know, inferred so far has come in the form of suggestions. I don't know when we'll have the last word about various phenomena associated with this rock art body, not only at Sanganakalu, at various other sites across uh, the Indian subcontinent. Next one. Oh, I'm sorry. So in general, to place to locate you, where I'm going to discuss is the mid-southern part, the Bellary and Karnul. Uh, these two areas have now produced perhaps the most densest uh, occurrence of rock art sites across peninsular South India. May not be comparable with those which have been found across the Vindian Plateau. But we do have, uh, you know, uh, many areas, potential areas, which could also reveal the intensity of rock art sites, density of rock art sites across these two regions. One is Bellary area, which is a uh, tor inselberg uh, granitic landscape, and to the east of Bellary region is the Karnul sub-basin of the larger Kadapa Basin, comparable to what we see in the Vindhyas. And we have numerous rock shelters, and during the course of last uh, two, 25 years or so, we have been able to document as many as 300 rock shelter sites in a small area, uh, one small area measuring about uh, 500 square kilometers or so in the Karnul region. And with respect to this uh, Bellary region, we were focused only on one of the uh, hill complex around the site of Sanganakalu, which also measures about 1,000 hectares of land. And in, within this, we have two distinctive rock art bodies. And since uh, Sanganakalu happens to be uh, lying in the present Karnataka region, my focus is going to be on Sanganakal Bellari region only. And then we don't see uh, spatial variation in the way in which rock art was produced across this region. Uh, the granite rock, um, you know, tor Inselberg landscapes. We may see stylistic variations because sometimes the rock surfaces, the texture of the rock, um, you know, and the metamorphose status of the rock also governs the way in which uh, uh, the imageries were produced. But that apart, we don't see variation in terms of breeds or species or things like that. It's all common to the entire peninsula region. And um, so the variation is only in the way in which artists were producing and the rock surface was governing the way in which the imageries were produced and so on. Mm. So as I mentioned, this is uh, the productivity of landscape is governed by the basic geomorphology, topography, and uh, 
enolithic resources uh, that are available. In addition to that, we have these climate phenomena which plays a more important role in the way in which uh, subsistence economy could be established in this area. This is a semi-arid grassland. And as I said in the beginning, um, agricultural economy is a combination of both uh, plant cultivation as well as uh, you know, and cultivation of select animals and so on. As far as we know from the uh, what we call archaeozoological record, we have a clear understanding of the fact that pastoralism was introduced into this area. So there are two groups of animals which are domesticated. One is uh, uh, sheep goat uh, and the cattle. Cattle is suspected to be native to this re uh, region, and we have three centers with across the subcontinent where cattle has the Indian Jebu cattle. That's the only one which is available, known from India. Uh, that is the Jebu, the Bos Indicus, right from Baluchistan to India to Peninsular South India. Uh, in the archaeozoological record uh, from uh, across this particular Peninsular South India, we are not very clear whether there is a transition from wild cattle to domesticated cattle. But some of these imageries on rock, or rock do indicate that some kind of robust ancestors having been existed here, but most of the bones that have been recovered do not reveal that particular morphological transition that one is expected to document. But as I said, these are uh, late phase Neolithic sites in the Bellary region. So from about 2000 BC or so, older Neolithic sites are further north into Raichur, Doab, and then further north into Yadgir and uh, you know, further eastwards into Telangana area. There are some potential areas where we are likely to uh, hit upon the transitional sites from hunting gathering to early agricultural way of life. One thing is very obvious, uh, cattle is a local domestication and the sheep and goat were introduced into this area. So the productivity of the landscape uh, is reflected in the way in which these grasslands were uh, providing adequate pasture. And the landscapes, as you can see, is uh, you know the residual hills surrounded by vast erosional plains with no distinctive drainage network. That is what is to be noticed here. Yet we have high, very high density of Neolithic sites perched on top of these Inselberg plate. So this particular phenomenon was one big puzzle to many archaeologists to explain the settlement pattern associated with the Neolithic agro-pastoral economy here. So what we found was the low-lying plains were the regions where we used to have series of uh, water holes in the mouth pool, pools, ponds, and so on and so forth. And the inselbergs themselves were intruded by later dike intrusions. And then as you go back in time, the water tables were higher and higher, and uh, you can imagine uh, when the demographic pressures are much lower, 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, this was most well-watered region anywhere in peninsular region because water tables rise and then the dikes used to obstruct the underground flow of water from lower level to higher level. And as a result of intrusive relationship between host rock granite and the intruding dike, there used to be fissures and cracks which facilitated lateral movement of water and then the sites were all rich with uh, spring activity. And then the spring water draining down would collect down in the plains, and there were these erosional basins, erosional troughs in other words, where these perennial pools and ponds could come into existence. So these could be, would be recognized through a very careful geomorphological study and also sedimentological analysis of uh, the grains associated with the foothill deposits and the deposits away from the foothills associated with what we see some black soil patches and so on. And these black soils are a result of poor ponded and ponded environments, enrichment of uh, you know Mount Model Night in the clay, and that gives rise to permanent uh, you know black color to the soil, and it does not get reversed. You know. And that is one reason where we were able to identify the existence of uh, swamps and water holes 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, and so on. And look at the uh, spring activity. Uh, that was the one which controlled the productivity of the landscape. And the dikes themselves were a major source of raw material for producing polished stone axis or ground stone axis. As I said, we do not have very clear evidence of pre-Neolithic occupation in this area. There are some rock shelters which also 
give us evidence or clues to the existence of hunter gatherers uh, in the form of microlith scatters but then when we looked at uh, the relation, spatial relationship between microliths and you know stone axe manufacturing localities here we found that they were more or less contemporary and there are some paintings which also uh, depict the presence of hunting gathering scene and so on just by the presence of hunting gathering scene we could not we could not easily conclude yes there were mesolithic hunter gatherers here and so on but as i said this landscape was much more productive for uh, early agricultural way of life associated with uh, economy uh, of uh, cattle keeping dominantly but that was not the primary animal which was part of their diet most of the diet was uh, you know animal uh, diet was composed of sheep goat and so on. and so on little later we have chicken and so on but in the early stages local millets were the primary food crops and two pulses and two millets were the laid the basis for an agricultural economy and then there is a tradition which is associated with these neolithic settlements uh, that is characterized by the formation of ash mounds. I will not go into that particular aspect. These are integral part of this particular Neolithic way of life in this particular uh, region of Tor Inselberg landscapes here. So uh, one of the hills, which is known as uh, Large Hill, Peacock Hill, Hiraguda, and so on, was the site which was first uh, uh, visited by Robert Brucefoot, and since then we have been revisiting over the last 170 years or so. And you see, uh, you can look at the surrounding landscape. That is why they are called residual hills. Formerly, the landscapes were much higher than what they are, but that is a Precambrian phenomenon. At least in the last 10,000 years, landscape have undergone change. This has been a dynamic landscape. And then the kind of network of streams that we see now in terms of small rivulets, which carry water only during the rainy season or post-Neolithic in age. So we do not have a you know, Pleistocene network of uh, rivers draining this area, an erosional landscape created by sheet floods. And that is one reason why we have this particular uh, nature of landscape, uh, which was uh, well exploited uh, by these early agro-pastoral communities. So give you an idea of these inselbergs, as you can see, at the base you have a pediment surface, and then as we go towards the base of the hill, there is an abrupt ride characterized by these tors, and uh, you know, the summit of the hills are near, sometimes uh, give the feeling of castle copy, and so on. And then there is such a lot of rock waste, and this rock waste also comp comprises of not only uh, disintegrated granites, but also there are these quartz veins, which were ideal for making microliths. And so unlike in other areas where chalcedony and agate and such other materials were used for microliths, here they were conditioned by the availability of quartz, which is basically an intract intractable raw material, yet it could be uh, used for making, producing microliths. And then variety of these granites were also used for uh, producing artifacts for food producing, food processing artifacts. And then um, the ground stone axes were produced from um, what we call the intruding uh, dike, that is gabbro in many cases, otherwise it is called dolerite in general. But the specific one, the best quality of these dikes uh, material that has been found in Sangankalu area happens to be gabbro. It's very fine-grained, high-density rock, and then the polishing of these axes was much easier than using crystalline rocks like granite and related rocks in this area. Uh, the landscape overlooking uh, the ash mound there, uh, there were multiple ash mounds which only one survives because a small shrine on top of it. All the surrounding area, we see a lot of um, you know, cultural material ranging in time from 2200 BC or so. So initially, uh, field walking was carried out around these hills up to a radius of about 10 to 12 kilometers to see the lateral extent of uh, you know, Neolithic agro-pastoral activity and uh, associated uh, cultural remains and so on. And in late 1990s, this was the fate of many of these sites. And uh, this happens to be the largest Neolithic site anywhere in southern India. And if this was to continue, we'd have lost the entire site over a period of uh, the following 10 years' time because they were using dynamite to blast this. What was most important was to document as on a fast track and the most only method available for us at that point in time was uh, total station mapping. And this helped us in uh, identifying cultural features across this landscape. The folks, there are five hills actually, but uh, my focus is only on this large hill or Hiraguda there. And we see this dike running north-south through the entire hill. And then the, uh, the rock art sites are located 
are directly associated with uh, the dike there. Uh, it is like basalt, in other words. And as I said, it's a very fine-grained uh, texture and uh, easy to uh, incise, you know, compared to granitic crystalline uh, coarse-grained rocks and so on. So the majority of uh, the rock art sites are associated with the dike across. Occasionally, we do come across uh, um, imageries of bull depicted on granitic surfaces as well. But the highest density is on top of the uh, hill at the associated with the Dolorite dike. Nearly 2,000 elements of rock art have been documented. And vast majority of them are uh, representing bull imageries. And that is one thing which was bothering us, why he, the bull dominates, um, the question we have been asking till today. And then uh, <coughs> we have uh, very few other imageries coming up. Uh, you can see um, other features associated with this rock art is what we call ringing rocks or cupules. Sometimes they are called. Um, these cupules uh, have a di different relationship with the landscape, cultural landscape here. Uh, they could be interpreted in many ways, but we have been able to relate these features across the landscape into one system, cultural system. Um, and that is where we also include them as part of the rock art body here. And then we have the imageries of uh, a bull. Some of them are mythical in their form, but that does not uh, matter. And then we also have um, ringing rocks and then cupules also. Uh, on this boulder around the margin, you have these uh, uh, ringing rocks, and each of these ringing rocks are associated with an individual stone axe manufacturing workshop. And that's one of the most interesting things that we see here. And in addition to that, we have these uh, blocks of granite with deep grooves and also cupules. You know, these deep grooves were there for sharpening the edge of the, edge of the axis and the cupules were used for rounding the butt end, and then there are bedrock mortars which were used for polishing the surface of the axe and so on. Uh, this is another, uh, the edges, of course, not clear in this particular photograph. Uh, and if you tap them rhythmically, there's an excellent gong coming up. So the bulls, uh, the ash mound, the ringing rocks, and then um, you have these uh, workshops, you know, related to one another across this landscape. They are not accidentally there. They are, you know, consistently they're associated with uh, numerous, uh, you know, rock or uh, lithic workshops. With the entire large hill, if you go around, there may have been more than 100 lithic workshops. And the highest uh, intensity of production that has been um, witnessed in this area happens to be, according to radio chronology, it towards the end of the Neolithic and beginning of the pre-Iron Iron Age in this region. Uh, a close-up of uh, some of other uh, animal imageries that we see here, but the dominant one is the cattle or the bull, and a special place in the landscape as well as in the culture. Uh, at what point of time bull takes uh, precedence over all other animal figurines, the imageries that we see here? We do have some of these human figures, uh, which I'm not going to em emphasize um, at this point of time. And then examples of bulls, uh, you know, from other localities in the neighborhood of Bellari. You know, it travels across from this particular hill in any direction. You have two to three kilometers, you have a granitic hill with the one or two. Uh, imageries of bull and so on. Uh, see weathering, and then there is this overlapping and uh, you know chain of people going around the bull imageries. We do have elephant here, uh, and several other these things. So this is the one which I talked about: the cupules, which were meant for uh, rounding the butt of the axe, and then the grooves, which were meant for sharpening the edge of the stone axis, and so on. And more deeper grooves that we see in the granitic rock. And then the uh, bedrock hollows are much more. And we come across these features much more frequently across this landscape in association with uh, the um, rock art lithic workshops, which I am not uh, showing on this occasion. So go to other sites. You have similar features repeated. And there is no variation that we see in the way in which the bulls were depicted across the landscapes. Um, they are one and the same, but the artists have uh, their own free hand. Uh, and then we see this kind of overlapping, causing problems for separating them you know, into layers and so on. There's a tiger, one rare example that we come across, but still we have these wild animals in this area. So you have human figures, then some of those uh, wild animals as well. Uh, and the bull occupies the most dominant place uh, in this particular landscape. And so you have this variation but doesn't mean it is a different species altogether. 
So what is more important, trying to understand the meaning of rock art. Have we been able to understand the meaning because we don't know the mind which created it? We have no access to the mind which we created it. But cultural context should be able to help us, you know, draw some inferences. And then the way in which this particular landscape was, you know, facilitating the intensity of human activity in this area. And rock art was produced in the context of productivity of the landscape. That is my understanding of this part. Uh, so the peak of rock art activity in this region seems to be from around 1900 BC to uh, 1200 BC time period. And that is where the bull imagery dominates. And then we have uh, these interlocking bulls depicted across this landscape, not only in one or two places, at a number of places. Uh, but at rock art, um, <coughs> are they simply uh, interlocked bulls or anything more? There is some clue for you know, optical illusion here. Can anybody help identify another feature hidden in this image? Over. Can anybody help identify another feature hidden in this interlocked bull? Star is there. Something more than a star. What does it mean? Flower. Doubt? Flower. Flower. <coughs> you have terracotta mother goddesses, plenty of them, coming right from the Mahargar context. It's called mother of peril, I mean, they have called it mother of girl. But we get this continuity of mother god clay figurines throughout the last 10,000 years of agricultural societies across the Indian subcontinent. So there is a direct relationship right from Southwest Asia. We have seen that bull and the mother have been occurring together. There are sanctuaries, you know, uh, for b mother, mother and the bull, you know, in Kayamian culture of pre-pottery Neolithic in, uh, in, in the Levant. And that has been continued. We come across this bull and mother goddess occurring together in different forms, not only in uh, the northwestern part of the subcontinent, we have them in the Jorway context here and also in southern Indian context. So I'm trying to figure out the relationship between this is not simply an interlocked bull, it is much more than that. And these are the sanctuaries associated with the uh, time period when the axe production at Sanganakalu was the highest. Uh, during the second millennium BC. And then these productive landscapes were the ones which also witnessed the rise of rituals. Whether it was the formation of an ash mound in the context of early phase of the Neolithic era, or in the context of end phase Neolithic where surplus was being generated. And here, that this was the time when we also have intensive agriculture coming, taking shape because winter crops were also introduced. Because this is not a landscape which could support uh, winter agriculture or winter crops anyway. This is a hot, dry, semi-arid conditions which only facilitated hardy crops like millets. And local millets were the small millets uh, like Prakaria, Ramosa, and so on. Uh, but then in winter, uh, when gravity irrigation was possible, they introduced uh, wheat and barley. And uh, by the end of this particular phase of uh, late Neolithic, we begin to see uh, the beginning of rice cultivation and multiple crops, pulses especially from central India were introduced. That apart, that's what I'm saying with the increasing productivity of the landscape, there was increasing emphasis on rituals that were being performed. This is for the first time I'm talking, talking about this particular aspect of rock art, which so far has not been given attention. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions, please? Nine hundred? Nine thousand to uh, I never used. Nine hundred BC. Uh, oh, oh. Prior to nine nine hundred. Nineteen hundred. Nineteen hundred. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for this rock art. Yes, the site itself uh, was not uh, in existence prior to uh, two thousand BC. Uh, 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 good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, would like to ask, uh, do we find any uh, signs of historical paintings at these sites? No, the site was abandoned around 1000 BC. 
Okay. Later Because developments like at Brahmagiri and Kurugodu, there are Tekalakota, there are sites where there is a continuity into early historic period. But at this site, we did not, uh, we do not have. Even Subarao, after his experience of working in Brahmagiri, he tried to excavate one of the hills. He could not find uh, evidence for late Iron Age, uh, early historic and so on. In one of your slides, uh, there was a depiction of Trident. That Trident. It's yeah. a later interpolation. Late, later. Uh, that's why I said the superimpositions super are a big puzzle. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sir. Few figures had uh, bull with three horns. Yeah, mythical and ones. And that also with branches. Yeah, yeah. They are so some of the uh, mythical ones. That yeah. means uh, at that time su such animals were there? No, no. It's a mythical image. There's nothing like an... Uh, I mean, <laughs> Dr. Sarte will tell us whether such animals existed in the past. Any questions, please? Now it is tree break, please. After tree break, uh, Ajit Kumar sir be ready for Did that. I thank everybody? And thank you, once thank again, you, sir. I thank everyone and the organizers in particular for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be meeting you all and then say what I could. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. At the outset, thank you, Dr. Tejas Gargi, for inviting me, and Hemant Dalivji for having me here for this particular conference. I deem it as a great privilege and a luck uh, to be here as part of the excursion, visiting various petroglyph, geoglyph sites in this part of Maharashtra. And uh, I started off in December visiting uh, some of the uh, rock art sites in Karnataka for a workshop. Now I'm here, fortunately. Uh, when I was working, I mean, seeing those sites in Karnataka, I was interested, oh, when would I get an opportunity to come and see Konkan petroglyphs? Because I've been being following uh, Kevin Stan's photographs, uh, which is there in the net. So I was just wondering when I would get an opportunity. And similarly, when uh, Dr. Murugeshi was reporting uh, Karnataka sites, I was eager to visit them. Fortunately, a, a, a workshop turned up, and so then I could visit uh, that site. And from next month, again, I'm going for a workshop on rock art at Raipur. So I get, to, I get to see various sites. So that's, I think, a great opportunity and as well as a learning experience. Uh, since my presentation is uh, quite lengthy, and, uh, and Mr. Benny also has almost the same things to deal with Kerala, I would rush up things, and I I've, I've tried to include uh, uh, some of the slides from this region uh, because I didn't bring my laptop, so I had to take uh, the help of uh, Mr. Sham Borker from ASI, who was quite helpful in uh, you know putting some of the slides to my presentation again. So I start off my presentation here, and uh, uh, it has also been a great opportunity to meet young minds as well as old friends in catch up. So uh, I'm really thrilled uh, this has been a great opportunity. Anyway, start off the next slide, first slide. Can I have the next slide? Set, turn it towards? Ah, uh, okay. Screen view for one? Ah, okay. Thank you. Now, uh, since uh, those audiences, um, you know, quite aware of rock art, I don't think I'd have to go to, uh, you know, the technical part of it. Uh, so, rock art is artistic creations of Homo sapiens sapiens done directly on unprepared rock surface of caves, caverns, shelters, open rock formations, and the rock art found on the walls of the caves and caverns is sometimes also referred to as perishable art. On technical grounds, Julian Stewart in 1929 broadly divided rock art into pictographs, rock paintings, and petroglyphs, and Rarely forms combining the two processes are also observed. Cupules is another form of creativity. Sometimes it is debated whether it should be treated as rock art or not. The pictographs representations are created on uh, the rock surface in an add-on or additive process using natural and coloring alignments. And petroglyphs are created by tear off or a deductive process like engraving, bruising, pecking, etc. And so far, uh, uh, so is also the technique of creating cupules. Now, the possible creation of rock art, the true meaning of the intangible uh, meaning or the intangible beliefs associated and envisaged by the creators of the rock art will never be known to us, save for the interpretations we make of it. The popular reasons assigned are art for art's sake or leisure activity, allied with rituals connected with totemism, sacred spirit objects or symbols, animism, innate, innate, innate objects which are uh, given life like cons uh, constitutions or activities related to shamanism, sympathetic magic or hunting magic or fertility magic to ensure the safety of the clan, success in hunting expeditions and fertility related to rituals. Witchcraft, black magic, occult, belief in ghost or spirit, ancestral and evil, and exorcism are also considered to be reasons for making some of these. Created as part of votive or thanksgiving or merit gaining operations also has been suggested. Creations by shepherds trying to avoid boredom or as lithophones 
which uh, Dr. Uh, Corey Sutter just showed you just in the last presentation. And some consider rocket as writing or proclamation of a pre-literate society. And uh, in many places, uh, this is associated also with writing. In Kerala, Tamil Nadu, it is known as Eirthu. Eirthu means writing. And Ala or shelter, it is known as. So some of these are known as Eirthu Para or er er rocks with writing. Or Eirthu Ala, which is also known as or a shelter with writings or things like that. So the it is also some and in, even in Odisha it is known as uh, Lekha Modi. Some of these shelters where this in, in I mean uh, petroglyphs are seen, they are known as or rock art is seen. It is known as uh, um, Lekha Modi. So again Lekha in uh, I mean connects with writing. Now in rock art in Kerala, I, uh, previous works I think uh, the first publication on rock art and especially petroglyphs was reported and published by Facet, which uh, connected, uh, I mean, which detailedly discussed the, uh, the uh, petroglyphs which were found in Edekel Caves. Then RC Temple from Malabar uh, also reported uh, actually, uh, Facet and Temple together actually wrote this particular work on Edekel, which was subsequently published in 1901. And after a lull in the studies of uh, rock art, uh, the first pictographs were first reported from Marayur Valley by S.B. Thampi in 1970. And his PhD work also was based on uh, some of the rock art in that particular area. And later studies were undertaken by Thampi, Dr. Matpal, who was, uh, was the first to publish on rock art uh, in Kerala uh, with IGNCA's uh, uh, you know, uh, support. And uh, they have actually tried to discuss, classify, and date the rock art in Kerala. But Matpal, who followed uh, the, um, the basic uh, nature, which was actually followed by his uh, guru, Vakankar. So he also tried to, because he, he had studied Bimbetka paintings before that. And so he followed you know, the tradition that was actually uh, followed in Bimbetka. Uh, so today there are over 40, rock, 40 plus rock art sites of uh, pictographs and petroglyphs in Kerala. And uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, Sri Benny Kurian, Dr. Jenny Peter, Nikhil Das and host of others, a lot of sites have come out in recent past uh, uh, of uh, related to rock art studies. And even I have published a book uh, compiling uh, what I have noticed in at least uh, around 30 sites in Kerala. Next one please. And this is the distribution uh, pattern. Uh, uh, petroglyph sites are noticed, uh, a, you know, uh, right from north to south Kerala, but uh, the pictograph sites are rather concentrated in the Marayur region. Next. Oh, sorry. And the uh, location of city or settings of some of the rock art sites like Edekil, uh, Atla, Vayumala, Mandotimala, they offer panoramic view of the valley and its surrounding. Whether the location was also inspirational for executing the rock art in these locales is a matter to ponder. And because it has been reported so that some of the rock art sites were genuinely chosen for uh, also the para panoramic view it, which it gave to uh, the, the, the executors there. Some shelters like Edekil, Eritala, or Patipara, Tovarimala, Angkor have superimpositions of varied period indicating the preference or to uh, preferences assigned to such locales either out of spiritual or animistic importance. Some sites like Edekil and Eritola have been used as rock art for of, uh, sites for centuries. And now these are the, some of the settings uh, which you notice. Edekil, uh, this, uh, the lower one is the Edekil Hill, <coughs> which is also associated uh, mythically uh, with my, uh, my later mythical stories like <laughs> Krishna and um, uh, aiming the arrow and things like that. I think um, uh, uh, this is also referred to as Tadaga, if I'm not wrong. Is it? Huh? Ah, Ambu Guti Malai. So uh, Ambu means arrow. It was uh, the Ambu uh, was. It pierced the rock into two. It is said. It's actually a natural uh, f f fissure which you notice in the cave. But it is uh, referred to as Ambu Guti Mala in the sea. And similarly, in the settings, you notice that uh, you know some of these uh, shelters are actually uh, they. Uh, form a canopy like a snake's hood in certain places and uh, that is from Edithpar and uh, Marayur uh, this thing where you have subsequent uh, I mean a uh, lot of uh, uh, pictographs of uh, various periods. Now petroglyphs have a large distribution in Kerala as I said. Uh, why not Plato uh, is an exception. Rock art has also been observed in soapstone in um, 
കാപ്പിക്കുന്ന് ജനറലി ലാട്രേറ്റിക് സർഫസ് ലൈക്ക് എരിക്കുളം ബംഗളം ഏറ്റെടുക്കുക ദീസ് ആർ ലൊക്കേറ്റഡ് ഇൻ കാസർഗോഡ് ഡിസ്ട്രിക്ട് ജനറലി ഒള്ളി ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് ഫൗണ്ട് ഇൻ ദ പെട്രോഗ്ലിഫ്സ് ഇൻ ലാട്രേറ്റ് ഇസ് ഫൗണ്ട് ഒള്ളി ഇൻ കാസർഗോഡ് ഡിസ്ട്രിക്ട് ആസ് ഓഫ് നോ കണ്ണൂർ കാസർഗോഡ് ഏരിയ and um, um, otherwise it the, the granite or genesis is one of the uh, common uh, medium where you notice the same mm-hmm. and uh, uh, exceptionally you have also on so- soapstone uh, at kapikunda now this is uh, ericulum valiapara uh, this photograph was taken by jenny and uh, there are some engravings there and one of it uh, appears to be a footprint Uh, at bengalum you notice uh, uh, probably a leopard or a feline uh, with raised tail running away and then uh, at the at, at some distance from the uh, the first one you also notice a leopard which is actually probably uh, with legs tied up and things like that and close to it uh, there is a, a lateritic uh, I mean, uh, sort of cave uh, which they call as puli mada so puli is actually a leopard and uh, it, it is believed that 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 leopard used to be uh, used to take shelter in that particular uh, 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 this particular uh, cave and uh, the problem is uh, close to it also there is a, a, a water pool where this particular uh, image is noticed so that was also a water pool that catered to grazers uh, from the tree now at etuduka this is again in uh, uh, latrite you notice a series of uh, humped bulls uh, facing east towards the direction of uh, the grasslands there and uh, uh, mr bani was telling me that there is also another uh, dog which actually leads this uh, I, i i don't remember seeing that or maybe i couldn't identify it now at ariyatipari which is which is also in kasargod district uh, you have uh, petroglyphs uh, the motifs are again uh, bulls there is a deer and there are human figures now uh, the human figure at least this one with raised arms the genitals are clear in this and there is also a, uh, another one whose gender is uh, i mean uh, questionable with certain cupules in the side now uh, such human figures uh, uh, the larger ones we have also recently noticed two smaller ones there and uh, such human figures are also noticed in painting in irthala uh, that is in marayur now coming to the site which uh, 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 dr murugesh dis- uh, i mean discussed this is known as avalakki pare it is in um, udupi area and here also you notice that uh, there are human figures and what is interesting is this site gets its name from these white uh, you know uh, quartz flakes which is found strewn around that particular area and mm. interestingly it, it covers a very large area but this quartz uh, f- flakes which looks like uh, beaten rice so uh, actually avalaki is me it means that ha uh, poha so this white uh, quartz crystals are found i mean uh, surrounding these the area where these petroglyphs are found it's a large plateau but it's only around the petro- petroglyphs that we notice this uh, quartz uh, crystal and that is why this particular site has got this name avalaki pare avalaki is that white flakes which you think which they have related to rice flakes and uh, para means rock so uh, it is uh, only along this particular surface that you notice this bull figurines along with animal figurines all uh, in the same now in this particular uh, uh, dr murugeshi also showed this particular slide uh, this figure um, some people would say that it's a female and if it is a female also what is interesting is that there is a cupule right at the navel and also on the top there is a oh, i mean a trough like any so this uh, the, the pattern a which is seen on the surface this of this figure and which is noticed in that trough and that cupule is different so we do not know whether these avalaki or these flakes were kept in this and then offered as some form of worship or something we we wouldn't know but um, as um, dr murugeshi already showed there are some gamesmen which is also carved close to it so placing it in prehistoric context would be rather difficult 
Buddhani Jaddu also he has uh, stated. These are uh, photographs which were earlier were shared to me by Dr. Murgeshi. So here you have bull figurine, but this figure is stylistically more similar to, you know, there is a tongue protruding out of this particular figure and the face is shown in a lateral. So this figure appears to be probably later than what we saw it. It, it appears that it's got a stylistic element of Bhuta cult which is coming into that particular uh, form. And there are also footmarks which are seen uh, all along uh, associated with this. Footprints, as you know, that it is associated with um, the deceased soul or uh, some pious soul who have actually passed. In Buddhism also you notice worship of uh, footprints. In Jainism also you notice worship of footprints and things like that. So footprints are associated uh, with uh, rock art here in Buddha Jaddu and in many other sites also like we have seen here also. Now interestingly foot, footprints are seen also in along the borders of this particular uh, rhinoceros which we have seen recently here. So um, connecting these two again it seems to be uh, ritualistic in nature. Now the human figures which you notice in various places Devanchi Gotne, then uh, Avalakipare and then Usagimul some of them have also common uh, features of footprints as well as um, bulls. Now what is interesting is this cross mark which you see in some of these figures. That cross mark is also probably associated with death. Cross in circles has also been associated with death. And now whether this was done for some survey work or not, I wouldn't know. Uh, so I, I don't know, but cross symbols have been noticed elsewhere also. I will come to that. Now here also in uh, Jamrun, you have this male figure. There are many figures there, which is quite similar to Avalaki Parai, you notice in, in Goa. And uh, there seems to be some association with fertility cult, as that uh, from that organ you see something pro coming out. And also in uh, Kudopi, you notice that, that uh, the groin region has been, uh, you know, Q, it is, uh, the, the, that uh, portion has been removed for some reason. So was it for placing some offering? Or was it related to fertility cult or things like that? Because there, there was another female also which I noticed, I don't remember where it is, uh, which shows this particular feature where that groin region, especially the, the, the organ has been, uh, um, uh, you know, depicted in, in a depression, so probably related. And similarly, I think stylistically, the one which we see in Vada Rundane with that human figure in center is the development of this open figures with then you have them enclosed within a framework or probably a, a pit or a, or a sarcophagus or whatever and then moving on to the uh, the ones where you have the human figure in the center then again and en enclosed it with a larger circular one and here also on the top if you notice that all the four sides you have that cross mark in that uh, i don't know if this has a pointer on that elephant's ears if I'm not wrong. Now, uh, I think uh, some of these motifs have got the same uh, this thing. Over time it becomes more stylistic, sometimes it becomes abstract. Uh, then there is also depiction of uh, vulva in some of the sites. And also probably there is a female uh, shown with uh, in the act of a delivery. I don't know if it is delivery, but it appears like something related with fertility cult. And I feel that the, uh, uh, these uh, um, uh, square decorations which we have seen like carpet in some sites also probably had something to do with some ritual connected with death where the body was placed. Like you have in Parsi and all, they have this tower of silence and things like that. So I wonder if uh, that has got something to do with uh, some burial uh, rituals or things like that, which was later, you know, uh, because of the temple coming close to it uh, got uh, you know assimilated into that particular aspect now again coming to bull figurines uh, this is from Gavli and Gavli uh, Dr. Murgeshi tells me he had found something uh, something associated with Neolithic period also some associated with megalithic period uh, uh, but whatever is uh, this thing that knotted uh, bull which you see it's got an iconographical character sometimes they say that it is associated with mantla uh, dr korisetter was showing us one from uh, another side there and now this uh, lower portion is the uh, one on viridi which has been shown again uh, which was there in sindhudurg which now which is now so under submergence and similarly you have uh, from bushkewadi you have again bull figurines some of these bull figurines which from bushkewadi resembles the local cattle uh, the hilari type of uh, cattle which is seen in that area, particular area. 
Now coming back to Kerala, again this is uh, a depiction of uh, the feet symbol is there and then there is also a deer which comes from Velari, uh, uh, Viliyakambam Kota or Kapikuna which is in Vainad, this is over in soap, soapstone. Then again, uh, the edical shelter, which I saw, told you that it is associated that if you see it from a very distant, you feel as though a female is reclining. So that female is associated with Tadaka. And uh, um, then apart from that, uh, edical shelter has also been associated with Mudupulli, Kutichatan and other things. So this is basically not a cave, it's a shelter. Shelter in the sense that on the top, uh, it's actually, uh, uh, it's between two rocks and uh, between the above, on the between the rocks, there are three rocks placed or uh, naturally formed, which gives it a, a dimension of a shelter. It's not a true cave in that sense. This edical uh, contains the largest number of petroglyphs. Uh, I, I, we believe that this one in the center with those headgears and uh, uh, arms raised with probably uh, palm leaves and things like that. These two probably figures are the most earliest in that with elongated bodies, I um, mean cylindrical bodies. These two figures are the probably the earliest and uh, over a period a lot of uh, petroglyphs have been carved in this particular area. So um, probably this is uh, probably the, these two figures are probably the earliest. Subsequently you have a lot of figures abstract and stylistic uh, carved along the walls so this, uh, this, this is again, you, you can notice the stylistic dimension which, uh, you know, female forms achieve over period. Uh, some the gender are not clear, but in some the gender is very obvious. And uh, some of these figures have got, you know, uh, some uh, leaf like headgears in the top, whether it is shamanistic as a ritual or the thing, we do not know. But you can see the way that uh, by concave body style, you know, finally getting a triangle form which continues to this day. Even if you move, see some of the paintings in Verli and other things, you notice that but this particular style of having triangular body continued. And these are again some of the uh, figures here, uh, which is carved on the opposite wall, the thing. And uh, in the center is a figure with raised hand and a beaked head in the bottom view. There are also some shamanistic figures shown uh, standing over. Oblique lines are natural. Or oblique lines are natural, yeah. So sometimes the reading gets wrong, you know, if you put together that particular uh, oblique lines, uh, sometimes the reading gets wrong. So uh, this is that particular figure human figures of varied natures but over the period of time right from naturalistic uh, to stylistic so uh, that movement you can notice that how uh, some of the female forms are only depicted as triangles or uh, trapezes uh, and uh, the concentration becomes on the hip and the yoni portion rather than the physical uh, structure and how uh, uh, you know the motifs get stylized with the uh, period of time now such human figures have uh, also been reported from Perumakkal, Adichanalur. Uh, Adichanalur, we have also found that particular uh, so-called... Now mother goddess is a common terminology which we use, whether it is actually a mother goddess in that particular concept can be debated on. But certain female figures, apart from that we have also um, uh, squares, ladders, circles, and what is interesting is that Edekil has got a series of inscriptions. And now these inscriptions are carved at the end of, uh, or towards the southern wall, if I'm not wrong, southern end of these pictro uh, where these petroglyphs are placed. So probably this area was already filled with uh, petroglyphs, so that they found that empty space towards the end and placed this uh, inscription there. Now the earliest inscription is dated to first century, second century AD by Ayravadam Mahadevan. Now if uh, we have also got Kadamba inscriptions there. Uh, this is one of the earliest Kadamba inscription from Kerala which is dated to 5th, 6th century that you notice in Edekil. So, from 2nd century, 3rd century AD to, uh, to Kadamba period of 5th century, early 5th century, 6th century, this site was known to people because they have uh, put up inscription and many of them are of royal nature. So this was known to people and it was probably treated as a place of worship or religious this thing. That is why uh, habitational deposit did not yield any other material uh, during clearance. So if we take 2nd century, 3rd century AD as the benchmark, for uh, early historic period and push back the antiquity by another thousand years, even then it would only land up in 
8th century BC or so. So even 1000 BC, we say that uh, Kerala had contact with Mediterranean region because of uh, King Solomon mentioning spices um, uh, in uh, 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 Queen Sheba offering spices to King Solomon and things like this. So trade probably existed in that particular region and megalith today in Kerala is also rated to 1200 BC or so. And the, the most common uh, remains around that particular area are megaliths and uh, close to this area uh, during British times a uh, lot of urn fields were reported but due to uh, land occupation now uh, in some areas we do notice uh, megaliths uh, some of them are all disturbed these are two megaliths very close to the scene apparent meaning again you can notice that there is some similarity with uh, the Bhuta cult and uh, Teyam forms which are enacted today. This is the modern version. This, in, this needn't be, have been you know, in, in the past also. But they use very light material because the headgear is very large. And in order to balance them, they hold it in the thing. And it is rather light. And uh, so you notice that there is some similarity with the Bhuta cult and um, uh, Tayyam cult which is say. Some of the motives probably are also uh, related to common folk where you know there is a figure with a basket with a, probably a child inside. Maybe indicative of such practices. Now this uh, bird headed figure. We have some bird headed forms, uh, megalithic also uh, from Kumati and that figure is from uh, Thirumalai in uh, Tamil Nadu which I had told yesterday that there are some uh, figures with uh, you know bird heads. Now such figures are noticed also here in rock art with those typical, uh, there are some motives like ladder motif and things like that. Now some of the people associate this with Kurumba tribe which lived in this. There is a documentation by Breeks of a Kurumba hut which shows uh, uh, certain paintings on uh, the wall surface. But the motives which are used here are quite different from the motives which you see in edical engravings. So the religious dimensions are different. Now uh, uh, Kurumbas live uh, in a place called Valarikombe. Well, Arikombe is uh, noticed, it is in uh, Nilgiris and here you have pictographs and the commonality with the, these, between these two are uh, <coughs> uh, the headgear, the large headgear which resembles, you know, uh, shamanistic tradition or something. And interestingly, the, uh, the, the Kurumbas there, they are ten Kurumbas, they still worship uh, this particular thing as now it is under forest department so they are not allowed to go inside. Earlier they used to hunt and sacrifice animals for these animals in order to strengthen their power that is what they told. But now they have shifted more into the um, uh, valley area but they still worship this and they can they name give different names to it. Uh, Maladeva, Holy Deva and etc. And at the bottom you notice that there are two uh, feet impressions which is connected with a chain. That is also a part of spirit worship. The other figures which you can relate probably with, uh, you know, Yakshagana and all this. This is the things. Now, uh, after uh, the, the uh, yeah, after uh, that uh, uh, ghat was opened up, uh, accidents were frequent. So it was believed that the person who had shown the um, direction for for the Britishers to cut that ghat, he was, he was actually murdered and the Britisher took credit of it. So it, is, it was believed that it is the spirit of this uh, tribal person who showed the way, he is causing the uh, accidents in that ghat. So it is believed that after that particular incident, his spirit was actually enchained into this you know um, chain and it was uh, kept, uh, this chain is actually hung on a uh, tree at the starting of that particular ghat section. Now, uh, Kurumbas of Valarikumbe, I think uh, they are associated with uh, ancestral uh, worship. And this is the domestic uh, art which is practiced. R. Krishna is a, a celebrated artist of the Kurumba group, but what he does that art on paper now. And uh, it is supported by um, uh, certain NGOs. But in the designs or the motives used is in the paintings are more domestic, rather they are not religious. Uh, Govinda Mula, it is again uh, close to uh, Edekil where you notice, let's say, Tovarimala, you notice that there is a difference in the depth 
and linearity of that particular motus which is achieved for medical. These belong to later period. Some of them uh, identified it was vulva motif and things like that. Again, coming to the same site, Poyangutti, which is another uh, site where the thing, uh, that uh, mm, checkered design which you noticed in uh, the thing, that is, uh, 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 not pare, but Uddhana Jaddu, that same motif is there, and so also that chariot uh, type of motif and the sundial. It is noticed there. Angkor, Angkor also has a similar motive of uh, the sundial and uh, that particular, uh, you know, palm leaf-like motive. And some of them are very late uh, engravings. Again, these are actually some of these are reported from uh, Benny's work. Then Tovarimala in Chulli Meda, where you have cupules. One is in Tovarimala, Chulli and uh, Charmanga. Charmanga is this uh, megalithic uh, one with uh, cupules. Patipara, I am not going into Patipara because here you can notice that uh, phase of that particular. I, uh, I go with my family in certain places where I can take them, so I also make use of them to <laughs> carry me around. <laughs> so. These are again certain uh, motors which you see there. And now just coming to the interesting part, in many places we notice that, you know, we say that red paintings are early, white paintings are later, later or oh, superimposition and blah, we keep telling so many things. But what is interesting is that it isn't the same cave which, I mean, shelter which we notice now. There is, that, that is how that particular uh, writing looks to naked eye. But when it was enhanced by you using, uh, you know, what is that? I forgot that. What? Eh? D stretch. You can see that uh, uh, the names are written in English. Bhayan, um, three names are written in English. Now, English, when did it come down to Mario region, which is so inaccessible? So, so it should have been done. There, is a, there are tribal groups which stay close to that place. So it must have been some student who was educated enough to write his own name there in this particular, using the same technique. Yeah, time up. So I'm just rushing. So. These are some of the pictographs, I'm not going to, and uh, some of them do sh seem to show some of these uh, traditions associated with um, uh, the Kavadi and things like that, because Tamil population is there. Okay. I'm not trying to go into the date of the thing, this some of the early classification, but today it is generally um, believed that none of this goes to Neolithic or Mesolithic. They are ba basically datable only to megalithic times. Now, uh, you notice that there are megaliths in Mariru region, and you notice that uh, some of the megaliths have got uh, such r I mean stone cut into blocks and then used for uh, construction. So this stone cutting comes only at a later period for uh, even in temple activity it comes at a later period and some of these uh, caves have also got uh, writing uh, in tamil and things like that so this this photograph again is by benny where he reports benny remains most of the time in the forest and <laughs> with the tribal <laughs> element so he gets the first information then he passes on to us so we 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 somehow then try to make it to the uh, site and I, I, I really say that I, I have never gone on an exploration uh, drive like he does. Because some, sometimes there will be uh, workshops organized. In, in Mariur, there was a workshop organized by state archaeology department. So that is how I could make it to many of these sites. Which are, but still, some of them which are in very high altitudes, we could not make it because it's under forest and things like that. He sometimes very privileged, I feel, that he goes into very, all the forest uh, area, which is not, it's debarred for us. Okay, so uh, concluding observing, the earliest seems to be uh, the, uh, the petroglyphs from Edekil, and uh, they do not seem to go earlier than 1000 BC. I said that 1200 is the megalithic time frame, which has been, um, we have got carbon-14 dating. So um, that is how it stands. Pictographs of Marair region also seems to date right from, because megalithic in Marair region is late. So I think the pictographs, uh, if they are associated with them, then they are late. And this is a book which I brought about on uh, art of history. And I remember uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Kaur said and asking me, what is Sajit Rup art of history? <laughs> and he saw this particular title. 
anyway, so that is it. So these are some of the articles which I've written on uh, rock art and some of the samples. Anyway, that is all for now. Acknowledgement, Dr. Tejas. Then, uh, of course, to the whole organization which conducted this, Dr. Banna, Dr. Bansilal Malla, my wife and family, then Dr. Jenny Peter, Sri Beni Kurin, Hemachandran, Sachin Tiwari, Prem Kumar, Krishna Raj, OK Johnny. So many people have helped me out in all these activities. So I don't owe them all a very, very big thanks. So thank you. Thank you so much, sir. <coughs> Only one question. Anyone? In one of your slides, there were two, two human figures, sculptures, like something like was there. Human figures? Sculptures. Uh, uh, he's talking about the original winged... Are they uh, just uh, the No, no, they are not from uh, anywhere in Kerala. They are from Andhra Pradesh. The winged creatures which you saw, they actually is uh, megalithic. On one of the megalithic slab that... Uh, the figure with because the I, I thought it is something like Easter Island. That's why uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but it, it, I mean, that is not, this is Megalith, but Easter Island, that uh, physiognomy of the face is more clearly, uh, I mean, carved out. Here it is not so, it's just. Sir, so, uh, yeah. what is the antiquity of shamanism in South India? Shamanism is a living practice. You could take it to any 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 period of time because any pristine society, when they leave as a clan, there will be some person who is the chief. That chief of that particular clan would also act as the uh, soccer shaman to eradicate uh, problems that come to this thing and also to keep that clan together. So shamanism is not only as a rem because in uh, pristine societies, most of the e evil that is caused, we today say that, um, okay, chicken pox is caused by bacteria, that is by virus and things like that. But in, in their concept, they were caused by evil spirits. Good and bad are some of the things. So evil spirits has to be appeased by sacrifices and chanting and uh, ringing of bells and things like that. They have their own practice. But what is interesting is that in shamanism, if, when they practice, the phase is not uh, generally shown in the real physiognomic cancer. They always mask their face and then perform these things. Now, there is a belief which is also reflected uh, in um, the Bible, which says that one who sees face to face with God will not survive. So, uh, in that, that concept is there, okay, you see, because they are the messengers between the, their ethnic folk and the spiritual world or their ancestral world. So, they felt that if they see them directly face to face, also might lead into accidents or their death. That is one. Another thing, if you see the current practice of shamanism or uh, Bhuta cult and, um, uh, you know, this uh, uh, Tiyam cult, which is prevalent in practice, it's the community, the so-called backward listed communities which pass uh, perform that they are the performing artist in that particular so once they cover their mask and they attain that spiritual status then they are worshipped otherwise they are not even allowed to enter the uh, compounds of certain great and i mean households which they are performing for so the modifications the, from a simple person to a divine self is achieved by masking his own personality and creating that spiritual amb ambience by way of uh, some sort of um, you know um, process whether it is liquor whether it is uh, ganja or whether it is uh, mushrooms so they have to attain the trans state to transform them into human to a godly status which they find respect for No, antiquity now the question is again, if you uh, relate uh, that Edekel's uh, particular things to shamanism, then it, the antiquity might go even 1000 BC or so. But the problem is, it's difficult to, you know, come out with such uh, uh, connections. Tomorrow some group will come and say, they'll paint it red and say, no, this is, uh, you know, relatable to shamanism, this is related to Tayyam, that will become a problem. There is already in the bottom, you have a church there. There was another issue whether that church came up at a later time, it should be dismantled and blah, blah, blah. So these things, you know, to handle such issues, is, it's it becomes political, it becomes... Uh, you know, even we do have shamanism practice not exactly shamanism but kind of that in Sindhudurga. Okay. So even Ladit also mentioned in his paper 
that yeah, he, this he, Kodopi figure could be the shamanic yeah, figures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why I ask, is there any similarity you can find in between the yeah, There is similarity, and... definitely there is similarity. Now the practices might be different, but uh, in, in, you know, like they say, ideas fly. So sometimes, you know, have the same idea elsewhere also coming into being. I have seen some potholes uh, in one of your... Yeah, 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 I forgot. To, uh, yeah, there are certain um, cupules in certain places. And in uh, Gavali and Avalakipare, you notice cupules. And some of them are actually gamesmen. You could play the gamesmen, which uh, actually uh, so even th Murugi... This is natural, you think? Or? No, no, it is man-made. It is made me. And what is interesting is that uh, one statement what I observed or got from the people there was that um, normally they would say that in order the spirit does not come back from the grave to the habitation, they keep an iron object. That is the belief of certain tribes. In certain tribes, it is believed that, especially in uh, the one in Karnataka, they said that these gamesmen were uh, kept or placed near the human figures so that these spirits sit and play and they don't come back to their home to disturb the humankind. So, these are different beliefs, so we do not know. Because uh, potholes are also uh, uh, natural. No, no, there are natural ones, I do agree. Uh, because I have seen in Anjuna Beach, Mm. Uh, the laterite plateau, yeah, there yeah. are potholes, there is no other human figure. Because the, here, uh, the cupules and the human figures are associated, and then the same thing. You you observe them along close to their arms and things, so it can be... Uh, or this site was once under the water, No, no, no. was created naturally. None of the sites, are, none of the sites which I mentioned are were close to uh, the sea as such. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you so, much. so much. Thank you so much. And now I, I would like to request Mr. Benny Kurian, please come on the dais. Good morning, all of you. First of all, while standing here, I have to express my gratitude to three people. Especially, I'm not from archaeology field. I'm living on a, uh, in a different uh, platform and working in that platform. But the man who bring me to this rock art, after many of my uh, discoveries as well as my assessment, is Professor Giriraj Kumar. And he accepted my paper and uh, published in Burakala. And that was the beginning of, because at that time I had no idea how to uh, publish something or how to uh, come to the archaeology world. So thank you very much, sir. And the second one is Dr. Jenny Peter. Under her, uh, I had my uh, diploma in uh, archaeology in later, later after the discovery of all this. Thing. And the third one is, uh, Dr. Ajit Kumar, of course, because he also helped me a lot in publishing my words uh, with all the uh, standards and all. So uh, it's already Ajit sir is uh, uh, given a very uh, vivid uh, explanation about the, and a detailed explanation, authentic explanation about the raw cards of Kerala. Uh, I am, uh, in fact, so that my paper is, uh, my discussion is only restricted to the geoglyph. So the question that what is geoglyph and what is petroglyph and all. So my concept is that if a particular uh, form of land is used by the people, whether it is for navigation, it's a different example from abroad anyway, and whether it is for the shamanism or it is for the food or uh, anyway, if they are totally dependent on and there is some depictions on the uh, parietal environment or the, or the space, it can be a geoglyph. That's my concept anyway. So in uh, this paper, I am totally restricted to few of the very few geoglyph sites we have on laterite. We have many petroglyph sites as well as the, uh, this kind of uh, parietal uh, engravings in uh, many boulders and all in Kerala, Tamil Nadu border and all. Laterite. No, 
Oh, sorry, uh, extremely, extremely sorry for this. <laughs> because also one thing happened is that this morning, uh, when I opened my computer, I used it to wake up very early. Uh, a note correction, actually. In fact, I took a, uh, a different uh, <laughs> presentation. So I managed to uh, finish it within a few hours. That's what happens. I'm sorry for any uh, spelling mistakes and things. It's maybe auto correction or something like that. So anyway, uh, so I am uh, going to uh, just look at the cultural connectivity between different sites, with especially with the uh, uh, Konkan coast, I mean, uh, uh, Goa coast and uh, Karnataka coast. So I'm not going to explain much about the ge geology of that land. But anyway, one peculiarity of Kerala site is that from time immemorial, we used to excavate this for many purposes. And the landscape were used by very primitive people, or the people we called them primitive, uh, for uh, uh, grazing cattle, as well as for uh, collecting food or game, uh, I mean, hunting games and, and all. So, from Trivandrum to, from the southern side of Kerala to the northern side, in, to Karnataka, I mean to uh, Kasaragod, we can see the, these plateaus, laterite plateaus, with varied uh, distances. And it is discontinued. It is not a continuous stretch of land we can see. But from Kasaragod to up to Malappuram, we can see that continuity also. I mean the distance from the sea to the uh, laterite formation. In the land where I am living, in the midland, it is much more far interior in the midland. So it's a long distance between the sea and the laterite plateau. Uh, and, and, and we have a very seasonal uh, grassland we have, and uh, we have a very heavy rain, uh, so very few uh, months of uh, a dry season. So the grassland having almost all of the time have water holes or the vernal pools existing there. And many communities, and we can see many cultural affinities as well as the connection with this grassland with many of the tribes. Unfortunately, after 1957, or after we declared the scheduled caste and tribes, there were many uh, uh, mistakes we committed. Still, we are continuing by calling certain people as this tribe and that tribe. But from my experience, uh, especially when I am living with many of these tribes in the Western Ghats, and uh, they may all have uh, connected. And moreover, some of them are mixed also, mix, mixed and mingled also. So while conducting ethno-archaeological survey or, or a study, we have to analyze the interconnectivity between different tribes. It is not the same name what we called them or they called themselves. That's also a, 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 an issue. So. We have uh, uh, five sites in, uh, uh, geo I mean, uh, geoglyph sites in the uh, section, and uh, m most of them are in Kasaragod district and Kannur district, and one in Malapuram district. And there is a, a dif distance of approximately 200 kilometers between that we are not getting any sign of a laterite outgrowth engravings. So these are the Bangalam in uh, uh, um, uh, Kasaragod district near Nileshwaram, and Erikulam. Erikulam and Bangalam are very uh, close and nearby. And uh, Ariyitapara or Parayilamma Cheriyagava. There is some issues that in, in that uh, particular spot, there are many names. And there are many groves also, sacred groves also. And this particular uh, Parayilamma Cheriyagava is where we are getting this uh, 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 geoglyphs. And Etukuduka and Parambatukava. That is in Malapuram district. So from all this concentration of this uh, four sites, after that it's almost 200 kilometers of uh, distance between that sites. So we can just, uh, uh, you know all this, but again just for uh, clarification, and the Konkan coast and the Goa region that is or uh, Abranda, and then the Tulunad. I preferly, I prefer to call it as Tulunad, and uh, the Malabar coast, where we have close association with the Tulunad, especially the one which is discovered by uh, uh, Murugeshi sir, it's Avalakipare, 
uh, and there it's also called the Bhimana Pare. And near Bangalam, we have another, just near to that place, we have the same name. That is Bhimana Pare or Bhimana Pare. It is the same name. But there is, he... Buddha Najedu and there is a Bhimana Pare. Bhimanapare. And we have the same name uh, here also. And it is not much, uh, uh, I mean, uh, distance of a maximum of 150 kilometers or something like that. So, and we have, uh, again in Kerala, if you divide this uh, geoglyph or the engraving on laterite, we can, two sections. One is the Etuguduka region. Because the Etuguduka is the well-known site, that's why I used that name. And uh, Parambatukava. That's a very isolated place. And Aritapara is one of the best example of the geoglyph. This site is located in Kasaragod district, northeast of Payanur city. From Payanur city, we can go to that. It is in the foothill of the upper Kaveri Delta. That is quite important uh, where, uh, to the point what, where I am coming. And three human figures of varied size between 1.6 meters to 65 centimeters and two humpbacked bulls opposite to each other and the two deer are depicted on the surface east of the sacred platform. And one thing is there is a sacred platform in the group. And usually there is a cultural association presently going on between a tribe and uh, this particular sacred group and they are uh, offering their uh, things in the sacred space. Either we can call it altar or whatever it may be. And there are cupules and post holes on the same surface surrounding the sacred platform on the rock. So you can see there are two groves. And this grove, actually when I was there, the people are uh, not allowed to go there. I want to explore that area. But noon time, usually they are not, no people used to come to that place. Because they believe that all the deities who are thirsty of blood are coming out in the noon time and late evening. So usually the people from that village are not going there. One of my guide who came with me said, I cannot come to that place. So this uh, grove is nearby to the Cheriyakawa and uh, the engravings are seen in the uh, Cheriyakawa region. That is the uh, sacred uh, altar of the uh, Gra. And you can see some of the, this is the a wide uh, view of uh, some of these uh, engravings. A human figurine and uh, two bulls in opposite side. Another human uh, engraved, I mean, uh, figure there uh, with uh, some of the cartoons as well. You can see. And there is also one, uh, oh yeah, it's in the opposite side. It's a much smaller, it's approximately 60 centimeters only. Okay. This is the wide view of the engraving east of the altar. And if you come closer, we can see that the two bulls are opposite. And the deer, I uh, said it's deer because of the elongated uh, uh, limbs as well as the very compact and uh, uh, slender body. And uh, yeah, this is the small figure. And the other one with many cubes, and the third one, and a deer, probably a sapa, look like a female sapa. Uh, are these are on horizontal surface or slope? Horizontal surface. And it's a water source also nearby. And there are two, uh, near that uh, human figure, you can see that the two cubes are connected by a channel. That's also a known as well. So these are the engravings we are getting from the uh, area. And there is another thing. Uh, there are few megalith sites also around there. But I don't think it is connected with this place because the people have uh, no idea about what both of them are. And uh, 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 so almost uh, six uh, of these uh, chambers, you know, rocket chambers, which are already open, and a few are not open. I just uh, examined around there. And uh, the cultural affinity is of this, that one with the Mavalan tribe. And we have a tribe called Mavalan who are uh, uh, hunter-gatherers once, not hunters, because I don't think in Western Ghats we don't have any uh, very uh, experienced hunters. They usually trapped animals 
in most of them. Still, it's the way they are living. And the Mavalan tribe, they were mostly food gatherers. And still, they are the scheduled tribe uh, people who are living there. And they have some close cultural affinity with this site. That they used to come to that place. And they performed a sacrifice. It's called Ari, Aritraval. It is called Aritraval. Aritraval means it's uh, spreading the rice. So why they are doing that? It is to avoid or it is to escape from the deities who are frequently requesting for or demanding the human sacrifice. And it is the same kind of uh, this worship or the style of practice is uh, conducting among the uh, Malayan tribe also. Malayan tribe also in that area. But they, are, uh, they have no cultural association with this site. But they are practicing Uchabeli. Uchabeli means uh, the noon sacrifice. That is also for the same purposes. And for Uchabeli, what they are doing, they draw a human figure with a rice flower on the floor. And then after, they buried a figure eye nearby. So this practice, that is also mainly they are conducting for, uh, to protect from the deities who are frequently requesting for human sacrifice. Which means from their story, what I found or felt is that there could have been chances of human sacrifice in this place. There is also a chance. And this is also called the Pudakalam. That, that particular area is called the Pudakalam. Pudam, that is in the more uh, regional word, it is Pudam. So it's a Pudakalam, Pudakalam, it's, it's called like that. Because many of Pudam means uh, here it is the, the spirit. They used to, to come and to play there and they used demanding, uh, uh, you know, the human sacrifice. And the Bangalam, this site is also in Kasargot near Nileshwaram. And uh, as uh, Ajisari said, it is, it is also from uh, Dr. Jenny Peter, the photo. And uh, I was also uh, a member of the IGNCA project in Kerala. Uh, so I was with her in that time. And, uh, and here, the, the leopard is engraved. Uh, and some scholars are saying that it's a monkey. Why I am saying it is not a monkey? Because of the length of the uh, uh, front legs, as well as the hind legs. And, and the place, how they place it. And the tail is a little bit, uh, you know, it's not like a leopard, how a leopard moving or attacking. But uh, still, I found it is a, like that. And the single motive of the panther is depicted. As per the information from the local people, these sites have more engravings and cuff marks, but I could not see anything more. But with that, it too, un unidentifiable marks also there. And Ericulum, that's also nearby. Both these sites are uh, nearby. And this site is also located near Lesaram, adjacent to the seasonal pool. There's also a seasonal pool there. And the engravings are not clear, but a number of the cup marks can be seen in this site. The locals call it Kadikuri. That's a kind of game usually played by the people. But like what uh, Ajit sir said, there's a uh, regular belief existed in Kerala, probably in other part of India also it is existed there. So to keep the spirit after death, or the soul after death, we usually sometimes in certain areas, among the Kadars, they put some uh, sesame seeds in the, uh, uh, in the pit. Because they believe that by night they came up and they started counting all this. So it may not get enough time till the next day morning. So, that, so uh, likewise, there may be chances that that belief also existing there. And Etikuduka. Etikuduka is almost a disturbed site, mostly, I, because a, a road is passing through the middle of the site it, and that uh, fragmented into two, one in the east and the other in the west side. And cattle and uh, dog is also depicted. I felt so a dog because I will uh, give you the uh, detailed thing. And this place is also called Kali Maranja Idam where the cattle vanished. That particular spot where it is engraved is locally called, not the local people presently living there, it is the Mawalan people, says. 
it is the Kali Maranya Idam, where all the cattle were vanished. So to commemorate that, probably they may be uh, done there. And uh, nearby there, there is a rocket pond also. And uh, half of this bull is buried in the road. And, and here, while drawing this uh, figure, when Ajit Sar shown, I think uh, they have overdrawn it. And I don't think it is a half flag. And you can see the, the tail, as well as the elongated <laughs> mouth and the ears. So that is why, to me, it looked like a dog. <coughs> the dog is walking in front and leading the cattle because it's, it's a common sight among the pastoral community that the dog is going ahead and going in front of this cattle and they are uh, controlling them. So behind there, there are many bulls. And one speciality of all, yeah, let's come to this, this uh, uh, other, another part of this site. So next one is the Parambatukao. It's an isolated place in the midst of a very uh, extensively habited, uh, habitation, extensive habitation. And you can see that it's uh, approximately uh, 12 or less than 20 acres of land. And this is an open grassland, and some part it is a grave, uh, sorry, grove. We call it Kaab. It's a sacred grove. And there is a temple right now, and uh, by the time of uh, uh, a renovation, they excavated many, many figurines, almost hundreds and hundreds of figurines they excavated from the, under the uh, uh, last constructed area. And uh, this site is uh, located in Irumbliyam Panjayat near, uh, in Malapuram district. The location of this site is approximately 200 kilometers south of Etuguduka geoglyph. That is, Etuguduka is the southernmost in that cluster. And it is the southernmost glyph site, uh, geoglyph site in Kerala. Though there is a long stretch of laterite outcrop in southern districts and all, the distance from the site to the sea is less than 20 kilometers. And the geoglyphs are found in a laterite out outcrop of a small tableland. And uh, the small tableland has almost 10 meters of slanting towards the west, southwest. And uh, the geoglyphs include the cup marks, post holes, uh, and uh, uh, view of the deeply carved circle and snakes of different sizes, hooded snakes, etc. The engraving of the snakes are found in the southwest corner of the table, and whereas the circle is found in the west side. And here it is the engraving of the snakes in this side. And this side is the engraving of the snakes in this side. But it's not associated with the temple here. It's not very close to it, but within the temple complex. And these are some of the uh, findings from here. And in 2016, during a renovation of the temple, hundreds of the terracotta figurines were uh, unearthed. And still there are, people are coming there and taking as their own. And some of them are kept in uh, uh, Calicut University. Dr. Shivadasan has done a study, a beautiful study about that. And uh, a connected connection with the uh, this thing, you know, uh, the figurine, and there lived a uh, community called uh, Telugu Nayars, and the Telugu Nayars were, is believed to be connected with these figurines. And an overall assessment is of, out of the five sites, four are associated with the cattle rearing, and one nine community. There's a local community lived there, living there, and they have a practice of puru elekan for against the wounds uh, of the cattle and they are also living near the Etchuguduka region and uh, uh, that's also some of the cultural affinities and the dog uh, uh, connection and all that's uh, for already discussed and uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, this uh, connection of this uh, bull which is considered to be a local breed called Malanad Gidda in Karnataka and Kasargod Pullan in Kerala and Pulikalam uh, in Tamil Nadu. It's all have the short structure, but they are uh, uh, very uh, strong built with uh, uh, short limbs. That is one of the speciality which I noticed in this 
engravings from Pansani Mall to uh, Southern Park. Some of the, this I have taken the uh, photo when I was in Panasi Mall, this, uh, this bull, and this all taken from other sources, Malnad Gidda, Kasargod Kullan, and Pulikalam Jellikuttu Madam. And the inter intersite connection also uh, I have already discussed. And these are the, some of the human figures, it's already, Ajitsar is also discussed about it. Okay, that is the thing, and uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you so much. Even though Benizia is not, belongs to our paternity, always he is roaming in the forest. Even though having in the personal interest, he all the way come to here, he delivered his lecture. Thank you, Benny Kurenji. Thank you so much for that. Any question, please? Thank you. Uh, now, uh, last, uh, last speaker, Dr. Raju Nigamji, please come on, Dias. The point, where is pointer? I'm really very glad to be with this gathering and uh, appears to be an outsider to this gathering because I never studied archaeology or geoglyphs. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if caller mic is there? No, no. Okay, no problem. This is okay. This is okay. When I got the invitation for this uh, conference, I didn't realize the importance of this. And I, I was reluctant to come. And I must thank uh, Tejasji, Tejasvini, and Tisha from Pune, who have encouraged me to come. And I was not doing anything about it, so I started with your YouTube presentation. Before that, my knowledge about Jugles was an uh, article by Nand Kumar Kamath about Goa Jews into a local paper of Norman Times. So I will talk about uh, sea level changes, how it has fluctuated in the last few thousand years, and I leave it to you whether in any way that knowledge helps you to interpret this. So <laughs> that's why I put the title, The Sea Level Changes and Paleo Environment, Understanding May Help solve the mysteries of the geoglyphs. And my interest in archaeology actually, uh, basically I'm a geologist who was busy in reconstructing the past climate. So when you reconstruct the past climate, obviously uh, you come across the archaeology. And luckily Dr. Asarov has joined. When we were working on the sea level changes, Dr. Asarov joined NIO, and we all started uh, re-looking into our data whether it has to do anything with marine archaeology as well. So how I came into the study of sea level changes. Friends, when you open the newspaper in the morning, you get this type of news. Climate is deteriorating. There are going to be a global warming. Sea level is going to be rise. Many cities will get submerged. Why are all these news items appearing and everybody showing so much concern about the change in climate? So these are the <laughs> newspaper cuttings. And uh, it's all because of, uh, it came into the focus because of the global warming, which is associated with the greenhouse effect. Uh, we are burning more fossil fuels which is going into the atmosphere is a mother earth. This is my very favorite uh, 
this uh, this is not functioning. Pointer is not working. Okay. <laughs> See, the climate is nothing but the energy balance. We we receive the energy from the sun, and Earth radiate back part of this energy which is trapped by the greenhouse gases. That's why Earth is warm. That's why we all are on this planet. But excess of anything and everything is bad. So is the greenhouse gases. We are pumping more greenhouse gases, and climate is likely to get warm. But the another question comes: If we, as a man, only responsible for likelihood of sea level changes, then why, whether sea level has changed in the past when man was not so active on the planet, at least was not in position to influence the climate? So. <coughs> Because of the global warming, there are certain consequences about accelerated rise in sea level, because a lot of ice is likely to melt on the polar region, which will come into the sea, and is likely to increase the sea level. Change in monsoon pattern, which is also, these all things are associated. Increase in the intensity and frequency of the storms and fisheries. <coughs> so we'll be today, we'll be more concerned with the mm -hmm. sea level. <coughs> Where are, when I say that climate has changed when man was not so active, what was the sea level? Our general understanding is, I remember when I was a small kid in class fourth or fifth, one lesson was there. Samudra apni maryada nahi tohta. And this understanding is so deep in our psyche that our prime minister, when he was with, Taking the Chinese Prime Minister to Mahabalipuram, he, he wrote a poem. And in that poem, you see the line, Tum kabhi bhi na apni simaye langhe. He also thought that sea is at the place which is always it was there, neither it was down nor it was up. But friends, I will take you to the journey which will say that it's not true. Next. Sorry. So where were the evidences of? Okay. See, evidences are available everywhere. I'm starting with the religious evidences. Whether it is a Gita, uh, <coughs> whether it is a Quran, or whether it is a Bible. Everywhere the story of Noah's Ark is very famous. He was building the Ark in a desert area. Unless you have an idea that this area is going to be submerged, why you have to build a boat? Okay, so this is first evidence. And as a geologist, and by, I think by now, uh, because of media, everybody knows it. Where the highest mountain today stands, the Himalayas, millions of years before, that was the sea. You can, you can see the amplitude of change. Where the highest mountain, that was the sea once upon a time. That is called the Tethys Sea. But <clears throat> that is a very old story. Where we and you and me are interested in last few thousand years, during which the human civilization, uh, the mankind has developed. The, the time framework in which you and me, we all are interested. Mm -hmm. So these are the some of the sea level curves uh, which has been developed from different areas. Why they are different in different areas? Because this is called the relative sea level changes. So some amount of tectonics is also involved because not only sea level can go up and down, land also can go up and down and that will give an impression that as sea level is changing. So this is a relative. At one spot, how much depth is changing. And the sea level studies in India are not very old. And we are very thankful to Professor Raj Guru of Deccan College, Pune. Some of his students and colleagues are here. He was the first person along with Kale who has talked about the sea level changes. But that time, they were having only very few points, three or four points, but they started. See, simultaneously at Goa, R.R. Nair published the idea that whether sea level has fluctuated along the west coast of India. So from where they started, but you can see here, some of the time sea level was higher than today and sometimes sea level was lower than today. So 
Now, there is a growing need to deal it. Now, everybody mm -hmm. say because of our doing, because of fossil fuel burning, sea level will go up. So there is a growing need to delineate the natural and human-induced changes. Unless I know that how naturally sea level is going up and down, we cannot assess how much is our contribution. <coughs> so therefore, the efforts are being made to reconstruct natural climatic variability. We put it as a paleoclimate over which man influence can be evaluated, and microfossils are a small but good for paleoclimatic reconstruction through core samples with the limited material. So how we do, how we generate the idea about past sea level changes. Please bear with me because sometime I will go into the deep in subject. So don't worry about that. You should concentrate on the end results. So how we start, see if you can see this is a land and the blue portion is the sea. So from where the sediment comes, either by wind or by river, the sediments come into the sea. Along with that, there are so many microorganisms also living into the sea. And after their death, all the sediment as well as you can see at the bottom, year by year, layer by layer, sediments are getting deposited. You can take your ship. You can collect a core sample, okay, and with the help of dating techniques and the, uh, the type of fossils, microfossils especially, you can generate the idea about how monsoon has changed in the past, how sea level fluctuated in the past, how many times tsunami has come. There are so many other parameters which you can actually study by studying this layered sediment at the bottom of the sea. But how to decode this information? We use this microfossils. Ravi was making fun of me, he said he is a foraminifera man. <laughs> so it is foraminifera. I will tell you some quality. There are two types of foraminifera. One which will live in the water column are planktonic. And the bottom one, which is, are the benthic organisms, after their death, they settle at the bottom. When they are living, they live with the balance of the environmental parameter of the water. So they incorporate all the informations into their shell. And fossils of these shells actually serve as the pages of the earth history. So <clears throat> see, you can see here the left-hand side, this marker is not working. Left-hand side is the benthic foraminifera, and right-hand side is the planktonic foraminifera and thousands of uh, papers every year are appearing on them. Elemental composition of foraminifera, isotopic composition of foraminifera, uh, beside them, right? because they are the excellent tool uh, <clears throat> for the paleoclimatic informations. And because they are extremely sensitive to the climate change, a slight change in the environment brings a lot of change uh, mm -hmm. into the assemblages. There are 40,000 species of foraminifera. You change slightly a salinity, they, you can, you see the fossil, you can say that at what depth they must be living, at what temperature they were living, what was the salinity of that time, so that you can generate the history of the climate change, uh, what is happening in the entire area. And because of this, and more, they are less than a millimeter in size less than a millimeter. Right from beaches to the deep sea, you can get them. And because of that, we develop them uh, as a source or the tool for variety of applications like paleoclimate sediment transport, which is actually an engineering application. We use them uh, to decide about the pipeline from Bombay High to the Bombay, how the pipeline was laid with the help of microfoss. Think about it, this less than a millimeter uh, organism helping you to lay a pipeline. Petroleum exploration, this is an age-old application. Monsoon variation, how monsoon rainfall has fluctuated in the past. You can get an idea from the microfossil. And that was the work on which I got my first award way back in 1989 as a Young Scientist Award. That I have not born old, I was young also. You can also, 
get an idea about past fisheries. Okay, recently we have published a paper on mud bank of Kerala. Sir, you may be knowing about that area which remained like a pond during the full of monsoon and give a lot of fisheries when fisheries stop all along the coast. My student Rupal Dubey got Young Scientist Award for that. Then commercial application, I because a lot of jewelry design has been done or based on the forums. The paleo, how past tsunamis idea also you can get. Sea level changes and marine archaeology, these two things which I will be talking today, but they are also applicable to industrial application in the pollution monitoring. So let us concentrate on two, sea level changes and the marine archaeology. So how to generate a sea level curve? See, it, the strategy has to be twofold. When sea level was higher than today and when sea level was lower than today. When sea level was higher than today, we have to look for those evidences on land. Okay, Many places they are get disturbed, but still you can see at some places. You can see a notch here. Both the, uh, all figures are from Goa only. <coughs> but signatures are all along the uh, coast. You can see a notch there. So it, now if you see here, sea level is somewhere here. And notch is here. The notch comes because sea at its surface erode the coastal rocks. So either it create a, a cave, which you can see there, that figure, or they create a notch. Now this eroded material, the sea takes it to somewhere and deposits somewhere, which is called the beaches today. So these are the erosional feature when sea level was higher, but difficult to date them. But this eroded material deposited, this is along the, uh, the airport to uh, <coughs> Donapala, the road in Goa. Alongside road, there's a shelly layer, the ostrich shell layer, which is having a foraminifera in, in between trapped. So they provide excellent material for the dating. <coughs> so these are the evidences for sea, when sea level was higher. When sea level was lower than today, Actually, that is much more difficult to find out because all the evidences of sea level lower than today are buried into the water now. So here is uh, along the west coast of India. Uh, that work is from Dr. Praveen Handik, your department. And this is from Rajni Panchang, she is from Pune University. See, at the bottom of the sea, you can see a pinnacle and the type of fossils now at about 60 to 80 meter water depth. Now, if you see the ecology of these fossils, they all are very shallow water fauna. When you date them, they are about, say, about eight to 10,000 year old. It means these are the first indication that sea level was lower than today. Okay. When sea level was lower and it started rising up, the depth increase or decrease or the shoreline moves. So if you have a tool by which you can see the shoreline movement or the variation at depth at one place, you can get an idea when sea level was lower than today or also the higher than today. So this is one. And this is actually a very, uh, this is from Dr. Praveen Hanrik's PhD thesis. <laughs> see here a, a big fossil, which is a foraminifera upperculina, which is a shallow water fauna. On that, you can see a pink. This is a barnacle folding. And all along with a shaded area and right hand figure, you can see that Vengurla and other Bhatkal or Karwar. Now, <coughs> we got this at about 60 to 90 meter water depth. And this pink fellow, it is found only on a reworked fauna. Relict fauna, sorry, not reworked fauna. This, this pink fellow, is no more live in the Indian water. Where it lives now? Persian Gulf and Red Sea. What, it in the, what is so different between Persian Gulf, Red Sea, and the Arabian Sea? Persian Gulf and Red Sea are more salinity water. So if you put this thing into a story, when sea level was lower than today, 
lot of fresh water was taken out of the sea, the remnant water became more saline. And this fellow was living there. When the ice started melting, a lot of fresh water started coming to the sea, salinity started decreasing. And this species started moving, and when it could not keep a place, it became extinct along the Indian coast and presently living into the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. So this tells you about the how shore, so you can date them. So you know how shoreline has moved. <coughs> we also did a little numerical modeling that uh, if you take, it's based on the all surface sediment, it was published into the Paleo 3. <coughs> See the planktonic forums percentage into the total fauna. It's a very simple modeling. You put it into the equation, there is a lot of global equations we generated for the Indian Ocean region. So if you put the uh, planktonic percent, you get a depth. So if you take a core sample, and if depth is increasing, it means the sea level is increasing. If depth is decreasing, it is sea level is decreasing. So you can generate a sea level curve based on this also. Very simple, this is done also by Rajni Panchang. See, if uh, sea level is somewhere here, and this is a shallow water fauna, maybe a uh, coral indicator fauna, and if sea level start increasing, see, the fauna will try to migrate first. If sea level is increasing, it's trying, and the time comes, it could not keep a pace and became extinct. So, friends, if <coughs> now it's very simple. Mm -hmm. You know the depth here from where we are collecting now, and put the date. So, date versus depth. If you put, you get the idea about how sea level has fluctuated in the past. So we summarize all that information and we generated a sea level curve. <coughs> First time we published it in 1995, then we modified it to 2002, 2012, and same thing we repeated this year, a paper came in this month only. <coughs> now, this is uh, like, you know, the Aladdin's lamp. You can see here, <coughs> See, he, no. <coughs> Around 15,000 years before present, sea level was about 100 meter the, as compared to the present level. Think of it. Stand on the beach and think that you are moving miles and miles of present sea was the land. So this is 15,000 year back, sea level was about 100 meter lower than today. It started rising, it comes to around 7,000 year to almost present sea level. Then it has gone above the present sea level. Ajiji, this was the reason I was asking the question to you. <coughs> so, and after that, it has come down around 3.5 thousand years before present. After you, who pre you presented that paper. You were telling about thousand years back, you showed a figure which was having a lot of potholes also. 1000 BC, isn't it? Somewhere I have seen 1000 BC date in a one of your, or if I may be wrong. Achha, okay, okay, I may. So around three, 3,000, 3,500, something special was happening. And that was the time when sea level has gone down. And then again around 2,000 years, sea level was slightly higher than today. And after that, we were not having any good resolution. So we left it, the sea level there. But I think the time has come, I'm going to revise that portion also, the last 2,000 years, 2,000 years. Because we recently we were working on Gopika Patnam in Goa, an ancient port, and I got a date something around thousand year. It means around thousand year also sea level was lower than today. Uh, we were not knowing. Then I re looked into Dr. Nilay Kare, who was my PhD student. His PhD thesis 
there was a kink there around 1000 but since we were unable to explain we left it unexplained i think now the time has come to explain that also now this sea level curve uh, is helping the archaeologist in many ways this is a recently we published this curve in 2019 laosan and me that one was for the arabian sea this is for the bay of bengal <coughs> Uh, now you see here, this curve is explaining many of the mysteries of the marine archaeology. <laughs> I am starting with the oldest discovery, that is about the Lothal. Uh, with the uh, Deccan College, it started with the, between the archaeological survey and Deccan College. A controversy was there whether it was a dockyard or whether it was a freshwater irrigation tank. Because people were, when Rao came up with the idea that it was a dockyard, uh, nobody believed because there was no sea there. Okay, but you can see here around number four, sea level was higher than today. So that time the Lothal was connected to the sea and moreover in that so-called the tank-like body we got this exclusively marine organisms. So that has settled the control four decade old controversy. It was indeed a dockyard, and that is the world's oldest dockyard ever discovered. You can see number one. <laughs> the number one is the dis a chance discovery by a National Institute of Ocean Technology in Chennai. Still, it is a very controversial problem. I'm expecting some good questions from you if anyone you have doubt about it. When this discovery came, uh, I think I put a slide next, so I will explain to that. Number two is about Ram Setu. She was almost crossing. Uh, so Asji, you sent that work of uh, Nilesh Oak. Now today I will explain that one. <coughs> Number three is Dholavira. Dholavira is also big, already it was world famous for excellent water conservation system. Now, we added another dimension to it. The world's oldest tsunami protection measures were done by Indians, or the people who are living in this area. Because 18 meter thick wall which they constructed can be compared with the 11 meter thick wall which Japanese has done now. And we have done a GPR survey, we have dug a trench, and we found the evidence of past tsunami in that area. The tsunami could be one of the main reasons for decline of Dhala variant. Still, it is controversy. If anyone contests it, I will be very happy. Then five and six. Five is about the submerged Dwarika. I will again, few more slides. How much time I have? Okay. Six is still. Okay. Six. Okay. <laughs> Six is about Mahabalipuram. Now, no, I will tell you, Selva Kuppam, no? Yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, I made that presentation at many places. Some of you might have seen. And last two years, I made 47 presentations. And uh, still people want to listen. Uh, I'm really surprised to that. <laughs> because uh, Selva Kuppam opened another uh, chapter. Something is buried into the sediment. It's because they, the archaeological uh, people, they have, they have excavated that area, they found a remnant of a temple. And uh, <coughs> I have visited that area, we did an offshore survey. Now, like Dwarika, we found the evidence into the Mahabalipuram also. And so Selva Kuppam is north of Mahabalipuram. We did the GPR survey south of uh, Mahabalipuram, and we have, the, uh, I'm putting again to all of you, we have found the evidence that some of the structures buried into the sand that side. A big discovery in waiting. Anyone can encash on it. I am retired, so I cannot do it. <laughs> but you can do it. So it means north of Selva Kuppam, south something buried, and towards the Bay of Bengal side, about six to eight meter water depth, we have the evidence of ancient structures, something like Samaj Dwarika. And uh, since you people are presenting, you are presenting on letter right. Now, I was wondering, in Tamil Nadu, that uh, Chennai, there is no letter right. If you can correct if I am wrong. 
But Selva Kuppam, they have done it with the laterite. But today, Mahabalipuram, it is Charnokite. Now, Charnokite is a very susceptible rock, which is locally available. That's why those who have seen Mahabalipuram, all are pitted. It means present Mahabalipuram is not the oldest one. The oldest one probably destroyed, maybe by the sea, and present one is what they say, Chola pe people have developed it, that way they have developed it afterwards, on the ruins of the older one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, some of these examples, I have just picked them for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, I thought I have very limited time, so I put like, see, this was a, a thing which was still very controversial. When this, <laughs> at 30 to 40 meter depth, actually they were doing a uh, project for the Kalbsa. And they found some of this, uh, this figure here. <coughs> see, this, they were doing survey here of Sura. See, India today brought out a special issue on that. And these were the figures. <laughs> Based on that, uh, then Minister Murli Manohar Joshi and then Secretary to Ministry of Earth Sciences, Dr. Arash Gupta, they called a press conference. And the India Today brought out a special issue. But in science, nothing goes without controversy. Outlook Express brought out another issue. He said it's all hawks. Immediately. Now, <laughs> <laughs> Why they tell it is hoax? They say, he was asked a question. Sir, how you can expect a city at 30 to 40 meter water depth? And they were trying to, see, you try to explain what you know. So Dr. Harshkupta was an earthquake man. He said, maybe perhaps because of earthquake. So they said, earthquake only has buried, as this entire city has gone only in that area, nowhere else. So people were not very convinced. When he came to NIO and had seen our sea level curve, he asked me to write another paper. This, was all, this curve was first time published in 1995. This discovery came in 2000 year. Now this is, you can see 7.5 thousand BC, means roughly 9.5 thousand year before present. Okay, now see here. <coughs> No one should get surprised to have a signature of civilization at this depth. Because all the rivers which are meeting at that point now, they were meeting at 30 to 40 meter water depth. Because sea level was lower that way. And this was such a proof after that most of the controversy has died out now. Slowly people started believing that and probably this is the oldest sign we have it here in marine archaeology also. This is our flagship program about Sammar Dwarka. You, you might have heard it many times and seen it many times by Dr. Asar Rao. Now, <coughs> you can see a signature of an ancient uh, city, which is about six to eight meter water depth. Timing was given by it was 3.5 thousand year. Now, there were three explanations we are offered for the submergence of Dwarika. Some of our own colleagues in NIO, they came up with the explanation, it is because of the erosion. They, they are on record, they publish papers that it is not because of anything else, it is because of erosion. So one day I put a question. If something building is staying here and if you are eroded here, what will happen? You erode the foundation, building will collapse. Whether it will submerge also? No. So that, finally they stopped publishing and talking on that. Other group started talking, it is because of tsunami. It is tsunami which destroyed. I said, first you clarify. You want to say it is destroyed or submerged? Tsunami might have destroyed. Because tsunami comes, it inundates of purpose, then it go back. So how it will submerge? So that is a, then the, the another interpretation left only is the sea level. And you can see that sea level. 3.5 thousand years back, sea level was lower than today. So that explains the submerge Dwarka also is not a myth. It is a hard reality. It is a history. It is a 
as per the scientific point of view. I am not quoting any a thing from Mahabharata or Ramayana. <coughs> And this is the most recent mm -hmm. thing which was very controversial for decades. That is the Ram Setu. Mm -hmm. no, first, the big problem was there. What is the age? Now, uh, when that time journalists were asking me, I told them, I don't know when Ram was born. Okay, you tell me. And so nobody was able to tell me. So I said, then I have no opinion. But then Saroj Bala and people there in Delhi, that Pushkar Bhatnagar, uh, those who have seen this movie, Ram Setu, they might have heard this name, Pushkar Bhatnagar. It is there in the movie also. Pushkar Bhatnagar, what this, this group has done in Delhi, they collected the star positions at the time of Rama's birth. And those positions they have fed into the planetarium software. And I have seen then what was the star composition, what was the timing. They came up with the timing is around 7,100 years before present. Okay? <coughs> so it, now you put that, that time here, 7,100 years. Sea level was about 2 to 3 meters lower than today. Now if you see between India and Sri Lanka, present depth is about 3 meters, 10 feet. So if that time when Rama was supposed to cross this area, sea was a very, very shallow rather connected in between some shallow patches which can be put with the stones and other thing and friends rama has this word adam's bridge or ram setu has created a lot of confusion the correct word is setu band rameshwaram because when you say setu you get an idea about flyover the bridge no rama has not built any bridge what he has created is a band is a causeway put something uh, like in the river when water is low, you put some stones and cross over. So it was possible to cross over to Sri Lanka. Yes, 7,000 years back, it was possible for India, uh, Ram, to cross over to the Sri Lanka. Uh, so ji, you, to you told me about uh, Nilesh Oak's work about Ram Setu and Ram's time. Sir, normally I don't comment on anybody's else work. I simply say what I have done it. But uh, <coughs> see, those who are taking it back to 11,000 years, then my question is, if you see the sea level curve, 11,000 years back, sea level was about 50, 60 meter lower than today. And India and Sri Lanka was already connected. Why, what was the need for anyone to create a bridge? Okay, it cannot be after 7,000, it cannot be 5,000, because that time the depth has increased to about uh, 8 to 9 meter. So then it was not possible to create a bridge. So this is the only time when it can have it. And again, I repeat my sentence that this, this is not a mythology as it is made to be, it's a hard fact. Yes something it was possible to connect India and Sri Lanka by cause, a causeway at the time 7,000 years before present. Mm -hmm. So now <laughs> there are so many other archaeological things like uh, I'm missing that one uh, like uh, Mahabali Puram and other findings. So <laughs> see sea level was lower than today by 100 meter around 15,000 years before present. One more question. <coughs> when before this sea level was higher than today, last time, last time sea level was higher by about 20 to 30 feet, means roughly about 9 meter, 1.25, 125,000 years back. <coughs> After that, it started going down, 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 and you reach to the, uh, the LGM, the last glacial maxima. And that was about 100 meter lower than today. It has reached to the near present level around 7,000 year back. Sea level was higher than today around 6,000 year and 2,000 years back as well. When sea levels were lower than by, uh, sorry, this is a wrongly done, not 1,000 meter, 100 meter. Okay. Now, if, if I say 100 meter water depth, you may ask how far it is from this present coastline. If I stand on 
बॉम्बे और गोवा कोस्ट यू हैव टू वॉक सर टू मीट द सी हंड्रेड किलोमीटर एंड यू पीपल शुड थिंक दैट इफ यू आर दैट इज माई नेक्स्ट स्लाइड आई विल if you are you are putting your geoglyph ages to that period then sea was very very far 100 km from the present sea coastline think about it i am leaving a food for the thought <coughs> so when 100 km from the present shoreline at ratnagiri and 86 km at goa was the land which might be the forest that time might be because i am not very sure about it then the present day rivers we are running to approximately 100 km to meet the sea at that time okay now <coughs> so this is what friends which i knew or which i have done in my career okay now it is up i leave it to you how you make use of it but since this is a new i am exposed to entirely new things and Uh, i think i i committed a big mistake of not joining your field work okay i have certain question since uh, i decided to come i started reading about it i made a telephone call to ashok sani saab and he asked me why can't you ask to uh, par chawan and uh, so i said okay i am going to meet <coughs> and i have seen your video also now i have certain questions these are the some of the few famous you all are seeing it for last 5 10 days so i will not i am not expert so i am not going to talk anything on this but what type of question uh, these figures are making uh, as a curious student of science i have certain inquiries what is the timing or the age of this uh, geoglyphs uh, in literature uh, i am getting a different different age and it is possible also they all might have done to different different time at the same site the the lot of depictions of animals are i have seen now other animals and marine life looks to be natural due to proximity mm -hmm. to the sea but when i see a figure of uh, mm -hmm. elephant and rhinos i was really wondering we don't get any elephant in this uh, region now okay and kerala of course elephants are there but not in ratnagiri and goa which is the hardcore area of geoglyphs and rhino how you get rhino here uh, so that's what i put uh, see wha what somebody will make the figures either which you see if i have to paint something here what i will do what i am seeing around that i will paint or if i come from goa or i come from uh, say himalaya then i will put some some of or delhi i will put a qutub minar there or if i want to have a religious mind i will do some abstract drawings now sade uh, sahab aap bata sakte hain aapko rhino ka koi fossil mila ya parsi aap bata sakte hain acha yes so it means that's what i written <laughs> what is the memory if people painted it on the west coast of india they came from a region where these animals used to live if you say it is in gujarat means the people who have made this engravings they they migrated and that is possibility because rhinos were available Uh, right from the afghanistan to assam now that they, they have shrunk that area and they are only in the assam so i am not expert i am just raising the questions you think about it but india have a very long history of sea faring okay long history yes parji most of no okay yeah. yeah okay that that that's what very very uh, logical explanation 
But then where have have anybody reported any fossil in this region? There's no fossil. There's no fossil. Why? Okay, so when... But it will not be necessary that we have to, because it may be an exaggeration or maybe he may be mistaken in something. Anyway, it is in the record. See, when it is engraved, it means either it was in that area. Okay. Now something, if it is not there, I, I always see three explanations. First thing, if they were not there, it means it came in their memory. So they painted it. Second is, it was there, but it came from somewhere else. And third one is, we yet to discover. The absence is not a proof of absence. Okay. Yeah, so in this part, uh, rhino is not a small thing. Okay, it fossils should be somewhere. How it is possible that animal altogether who was painted disappeared from region without leaving any trace of it? Yeah. See, when we get fishes, we get animals, monkeys, you people are the expert in this thing, what has been found there. I was interviewed by these two figures. Elephant, I can see, think of it, elephant were there in the nearby regions, even now. Even now, we have it. Not in, exactly in these locations, but nearby. But rhinos are not there altogether. That's what these two stalwarts of vertebrate fossils are there. Sure. I'm raising this question. Sir, sir, we have the new for this, sir. Definitely. Yes. Definitely. Sir, 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 I want to sure, sir. Uh, have some sort of this uh, from you. Yeah. Uh, when, when in 19, uh, 1918, I, I can listen, sir. Uh -huh. A very senior uh, astronomer came mm. from Gujarat to visit the museum, mm. and at that time, uh, the, you or uh, uh, this the explaining this the like climate change. Mm. So definitely, this the man interference is working. But at the same time, this the the uh, cosmogenic phenomena is also working, and he told that. In the interval of 12,500, the axis of the earth changes. And because of this, this change, this, the temperature also changes, and it brings the climate change. So please explain. Sure. <laughs> see, when I say, see, see, basically what you are asking, why sea level change? What you are telling is the Milankovitch variables you are talking about. The, these are called the Milankovitch variables. The climate on Earth change depending upon the position of the sun and the Earth. Okay. Now, Earth itself is uh, making a, a change in this ro angle of rotation. That is one thing. Now, incoming energy also is changing because sun is also not constant. So, in the world, there is static. In Gita, we say that the sun is varying. Even sun is varying. Okay, so uh, I remember in 1989, I published a paper about the cyclicity in monsoon. Okay, 77 year cycle. And way back in 2000, we predicted that we were going to have a better monsoon, which came correct. Because the cycle is, a, the radius of sun also is changing. Means sun's contract and expand. The sun spot cycle also have a relationship with the earth. So when we receive more energy from the sun, for any reason, the warm climate is there, lot of ice and polar regions melt, that water comes into the sea and sea level go up. When this, because of any reason, when we receive less energy, it became a cold climate. When cold climate, a lot of water has been taken out from the sea and deposited land, so sea level go down. So this is the reason why sea level has gone up and down 
when we were not that active on this earth. Now you can say you are using all fossil fuels and you are going to increase. That is, that is actually we are trying to change the outgoing energy. We are trapping more energy, that's why earth is going to be warm. But what you are telling is the extraterrestrial effect, that's true. It is there. But again, I'm coming back to this uh, rhinos. Just, just one minute, sir. Either rhinos were here and they have migrated from there without leaving any trace. That is not possible. They must have left some, some sig either they were not living, okay, either they were not living and they've been painted only on, based on the memory. Or they were living, but they have not left any trace. Okay, or they left the traces, but we are yet to discover. So this is a very open question. And one more, sir, you are asking something. No, I'm uh, actually what I uh, uh, want to add to is that uh, we are relating uh, because you have focused on sea level change and yes. all, but to relate uh, the presence only to sea level change. Uh, may restrict us. So why not pull in the monsoon curve and see a wet climate? Because sea level will have a problem because we have deep entrenched uh, estuaries in Kokan. And if we bring back uh, the present uh, or what you have said as one, two, five thousand years before present and all, uh, then it will be very difficult to imagine a habitat at present day uh, altitude. So, uh, because we have deep entrenched valleys which go back to late Miocene sir, and all. Sir, so, I, if yeah. we relate it more to monsoon curve, then we may uh, think, and you are, I mean, you are the best expert in monsoon, uh, uh, climate, so that, paleo monsoon climate. Sir, so. I 200 percent, I agree with you that uh, <coughs> the sea level and monsoon, they are not separate phenomena. They are integrated phenomena. Whenever sea level is changing, monsoon is also changing. Monsoon was warm and humid at 10,000 years back when the Holocene started. Okay? So whenever sea level is lower, temperature is lower and monsoon is poor. Okay, this has been proved in many, many studies. So actually, sea level, monsoon, and up to certain extent, even the uh, the st sea storms, they all are interrelated. Now with the global warming, you see my first slide uh, where I put the earth. I said, what are going to change because of global warming, sea accelerated sea level rise, changes in monsoon, and changes in frequency and amplitude of the storms. So sir, what monsoon you are telling? Yes, monsoon and sea level. I gave more emphasis on sea level because uh, it is very easy to explain with reference. See, see, my, uh, you can say, you know, we have been restricted to look into the oceanographic point of view of the global warming. So we have done, all, but we did also work on the monsoon, because monsoon is also depend upon the sea. It is the, uh, it is the sea which brings this air full of this moisture, uh, which brings monsoon. So if sea level is dropping or coming up, its surface temperature is changing, that's a diff so monsoon is a difference between the temperature of land and the sea. So if temperature is changing, sea level is also changing, monsoon is also changing. So if you are free to interpret your results with reference to monsoon, you will come to the same angle. What we are talking about the sea level change. Yes. not submerge the land area which is exposed. Monsoon can reach the area, but not the sea level. That's not yeah. my understanding. Yes. Monsoon yeah. will reach the inland regions, see, but not the sea level. See, uh, the, the evidence or the remnants of these changes into monsoon and sea level, see, we, uh, when you say about monsoon and then trench, uh, the channels, another interesting thing I will tell you, uh, which has not been uh, actually the objective of this conference about the ancient Saraswati. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know from where Saraswati originated and from which way it came. 
That is none of my business. I am not allowed to see that one. But where it was meeting the sea, you need not be a very great scientist or oceanographer. Just take the hydrographic map of India and see uh, at Kutch. If you see the hydrographic map, it will be exactly look like a delta. Okay, when you come to the land, it is also, I think, Subodh Chaturvedi's thesis, I discussed this. Land, there is no big river. If there is no river, then who created this delta? And we were doing a survey for a Sangi cement, actually, that time. I came, actually, uh, I spent 40 years in oceanography. Uh, we know the sediments. You tell me from where the sediment, I'm telling you, you collected at this depth and from this location. So, <coughs> All along, when you have a, the seismic records, offshore areas, lot of rivers channels, which is now filled with the sediment. Uh, this, uh, <coughs> I think, Jagger Fort. If you see that submerged wall, what people talk about it. Vijaydur, sorry, Vijaydur. We were doing a survey for that a small port uh, development. It because we have to earn our money for the research. So I was doing those those jobs also. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so we, I, I went up to the, uh, the fort and I was looking around, then I told my surveyor, I think the river was not meeting the point where it is meeting now. It must be meeting towards the left hand side. He said, how you are telling it? I said, I can see a small depression that side. He said, yeah, you keep making a story. I said, okay, no problem. Next day we were doing the seismic survey. Exactly, if you go to the uh, sea, you see a, this, uh, this type of a structure which is filled with the sediment. It means river was flowing from that area. Because when river flow, it cuts to the bottom up to certain distance. And after that, that distance is filled. So all along the west coast, when I wrote that uh, sentence, that uh, mm, the rivers were meeting quite far into the sea, all that ancient channels of those rivers into the sea is still visible. And very little work has been done because seismic, uh, I was, in uh, my institute, uh, we were asked to work with the certain boundaries. So I was not allowed to go to the, uh, publish any paper in geophysics. And geophysics people have not done much. Recently, Anil Chaube has published a paper on the, uh, this, the summer channels. Recently, last year only he published. Yes. But before I forget one more thing, I, I will answer your question. So that uh, when I asked the question to you uh, about the potholes, okay, in Goa, you had been to Goa, sir, any time? Yeah. Anjuna Beach, anyone who comes to Goa, it means you are not interested in hippies, seeing hippies. <laughs> See, in Anjuna Beach, lot of these potholes are there. No other figure, no river. You go to Sri Lanka, even Sita Temple is there. And India TV has showed that long back. These are Hanuman Kyo Charan Chin. When I have gone there, there's nothing but a pothole. And potholes can be made by two not natural way. Either a river or a sea. See what happened? A small depression, a quartz grain or something comes and rivers keep on rotating, rotating, so it will go down. And sir, I think uh, I am told, Tisha told me a big question that uh, dating is a big problem. Of the, uh, I came across, see you have to go out of box thinking for this. I came across similar problem when I started working on this uh, uh, Goa, Go, Gopika Patnam in Goa. Uh, those who are from Goa or visited Goa or heard me before on this topic. <laughs> Last 50 years, uh, all archaeologists, they were reporting there is a wall, there is a wall, and there is a wall. About 2 kilometer, 2.5 kilometer wall, made up of laterite dressed bricks, about 1 feet by 1.5 feet brick. Nice, 1.5 meter uh, thick wall. So what was the purpose, and who has built it? Now people were telling, somebody say it is from the Kadamba period. Some says, no, 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 Portuguese have built it. And some said, no, yeah, this is built by the Dampos. See that. 
So when I have gone, I, I thought at first we should answer that who was, what is the timing, then we can develop a story. So I, I have gone into the night, removed the bricks, the material as a motor used between the bricks. We collected and sent it for the dating. Now the dating came 185 years. I said, yeah, 185, we have a written record. The, uh, what you call it, the state records, they keep it writing. <clears throat> I said, just one minute. <laughs> okay, okay. So I said, then how to date it? It means TL dating will not work in that area, I thought. Then what I did, I took it JCB in the night. And near the wall, I started digging. And when I reached to the bottom, it was night time because for TL dating or for such dating, you have to take sample in the night. So where the wall ends, means today if you brick, build a wall on a beach, it means this wall has been built after 2000 years, around say 2024. <coughs> so I collected the samples from there, the carbonate. And that carbonate I got dated, it comes to about 1000 or 1100 years before present. Now, with that we develop a beautiful story, that it is the ancient port of Goa. And there is a steps going down which is now somewhere into the sand. We excavated that sand with, because we did a GPR survey there. So it means about 1000. Now that Kadamba period port, Chandor, now we can explain. Why Chandur became out of use? It is again because of sea level changes. But what you, why I raised this part whole issue, I can see a scope, sir, here. If, uh, whether it is a natural, if it is a natural, it, like Anjuna, if I see it, because with that I have seen it, there is no river. So river cannot make it. It means some time back it was submerged into the sea. And after that, the sediment which is filled into the, think of it, if your person has made this hole, whatever was, air was bringing or breeze was bring, bringing to it, or nearby, the sediment which is going into it, if you get a carbonate there, or you do the TL dating, you get an idea when this drying out. I cannot say it is a hundred percent answer, but so what's the trying? Go to any deepest thing, go into the night, collect the sample. If any, set, if any carbonate is there, then you have hit a jack jackpot, okay, when it was made. If you are not getting carbonate, you can go for TLD or OSL dating. And think that whether it is matches with your theory. With the, see, single evidence cannot say anything, okay. Now you are asking some question. Hello. Um, sir, are there any uh, Pleistocene uh, sea level records along the west coast of India? What? Pleistocene sea level. Uh, see, Pleistocene, uh, you, you tell me which period, Pleistocene is a very big yes. period. Okay. So, uh, which period you are interested in? Middle, late Pleistocene? Uh, not that way. See, I tell you, 125,000 year back, what scientists call it 5E with reference to isotopic stages. That time uh, sea level was about 20 to 30 meter hardened. Okay. Before that, the other evidence is Mao site, five lakhs years before, when Surat and Baroj was under the sea. Okay. So that is the highest the time when sea level, and after that 125,000, it started going down and finally when it is reached to the LGM, the last glacial maximum. Okay, that is uh, ending around 18,000 years. So that was the peak when sea level was lowest. After that, it is stable for some time. Then around 11,000 years, the, the warming started and the sea level started going down. Monsoon also started, sir, monsoon also simultaneously has changed. So that is the answer of your question. Yes, sir. Sir, I don't know your name. My name is Abhijit Dandekar. I come from Deccan College. Oh. And my question to you is about uh, the historical period. And when you said that from 6000 BP to 2000 BP, the sea level was higher than the 
present uh, yeah, sea level. Something six to five. Yeah, five, six. Uh, five to six meters. Now this has a bearing on the long distance trade that the uh, Indians had with the Roman Empire. Yes. And the port would be much more inland if the sea level was five to six yes. years higher. Yes. And the archaeological evidence that we get is right on the coast. So how do we explain this, especially on the northern Konkan region, like the ports like Sopara or ports like Chaul or Mandar, okay. which have been located archaeologically. So how do we explain this? Yeah. See, uh, sir, is there any confirmed dating about these ports? Yeah, I mean, we have found uh, Roman amphorae, so they are properly uh, dated. We don't have any radiocarbon dates as such. Yeah. But uh, the antiquity wise, the material wise, they can be dated precisely. See, this is a question which I am repeatedly asking. Right? My all lectures for the last many, many years. Is it possible you have a Bombay port, but you don't have any Jagar, you don't have any Marmagwa, you don't have any Kochi? If there is no contemporary port, what local people will be doing with one port only? Okay. That is one question. And another question, sir, you, you all archaeologists may be knowing better than me. Everything was happening only in the Gujarat. What was happening that time in South India? Not much. And no contemporary report to the Lothal we are, so far we have reported. So it means either they are not there, first, first possibility. They are there, but because they were on land, there is Further development, they have destroyed that one completely without leaving any evidence. Or we have a habit to know to go known area and do the incremental science rather than venturing into the forest and trying to get something new. It means it is just to be discovered. Other ports, because I did survey in Kochi, okay, the Chinese connection we have seen there, we got it anchored also. We are yet to publish that. I retired and after that I didn't publish that one. So, but I didn't get any port which is 4,500 year old. So, for another thing, I, I have read the So, they are not that old. But if it is there, then I am very happy. That no, they all 2000 years back to the period of the yeah. Satwana, the early historic period that I am talking yeah. about. And yeah. where you also have a, a Greek chronicle which talks about these ports. See, it is it is a very natural phenomenon. Port has to be at touching the water. Now today if you lower the sea level by 2 meters, your Bombay will go. Or if you increase the sea level, then again Bombay will go. Isn't it? Then what we will do? If sea level is increasing, then we may say that Pune will become a port and Bombay will be like Dwarika. Or if sea level is going down, then what will happen? Sea will is not there, so you will abandon it something like uh, Lothal, and then you will build another port at the new lowest sea level, like Dwarika. So this port also has to move along the shoreline movement. Now we are giving you, a, a, as an oceanographer, I am telling you how shoreline has moved. Accordingly, you can search for the port. See, the, the biggest, I am thankful to the NIOT person who has discovered this, uh, uh, the Neolithic settlement. Yes, you, any? Okay. I have seen that material personally, sir. I have also seen that material. So, very fragment. This much size. I will Why? tell you, sir, you all are archaeologists, I will tell you. <laughs> when I was doing this work in the Dhola Vila, okay. no, actually, no new concept goes unnoticed uh, without discussion or without controversy. Initially, you have to struggle a lot to do it. Just me, let me answer. <laughs> Your pottery is made up of what? Clay. Clay. Now this, what is the beach? The sea is eroding the hard rock, converting it into small piece like a beach sand. You think that your pottery will be into the sea for thousands of years and you get a full pottery. No, no, the process was abundant. See, abundance. No, 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 no. We have abundant, there are so many projects we have abundant. Yeah, but it was not productive at all. All those claims were not substantiated by the I will tell you, 
I, in my presentation also, and I never touch uh, any archaeology material because I am not an expert on that. I just debate I leave it to you. No, 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 but what I am telling you, as far as sea level is concerned, older than Dwarika, if you see that, if I can get back the sea level. It's not going. <laughs> that is the only time when was <coughs> rising hmm? and it, it for thousand years, it was also stable. Hmm. I think my, I have a good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, here. Lothal is here, Dwarka is here, and this is the time when sea level was either stable or growing very quickly. So if any chance of civilization older than this, Dhollavira and other, this place, if it's still any more older civilization is possible, then it will come, it should be here somewhere. Okay, nobody has seen it because it is covered with the city. So these are the places. So you debate. I am not entering into a field which, where I am not expert. But does uh, the tectonic movement has done anything in the uh, submergence of Dwarka, especially the Saurastrian plate? A very difficult question you have asked. Because uh, when I was presenting the sea level curve as a part of our RSE presentation in Anav. Harsh Gupta ji asked me this question. So I think the sea level curve is wonderful, but what about neotectonics? Yeah. I said, sir, I am a geologist, not a geophysicist. Tell me. I said, as a geologist, I am taught southern peninsula is the most tectonically stable peninsula. Okay? I said, I am talking only last 10,000, 15,000 years. You tell me. In last 10 to 15,000 years, what is new tectonics which has governed the sea? Sea bottom has gone down or up. How much? One meter? Two meter? Till today, to best of my knowledge, if I am wrong, anyone of you can correct. Nobody tells me how much was a new tectonics. Whatever we cannot explain, we say it is a new tectonics. Okay? Tell me how much was new tectonics. I said instead of one meter, it was 98 meter or it was 102 meters, but then it will make big difference here, no. So I, 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 in the beginning I said, this also includes, I, I call it not an absolute sea level, so it's a relative sea level change. So if any tectonics, for interpreting the archaeological purpose, this is a relative sea level. So it includes both. So no, in this there is no controversy. You are asking. Yeah, here I will ask yeah. first. No, I'm not giving. No, I'm not giving. See, they see, see, you see how we decide the port, location of a port. Uh, like Lothal, if you see, whatever sea level you raise, you cannot reach to the Lothal. Then how I am with confidence, I am saying it was a port. It is something like a garden reach of Calcutta. Okay. It is connected to a, it is connected to the estuary. And the fauna which we also got in Lothal is compatible with the Asturian fauna. So sea level was also higher as well as they are using the tide effect. So during the high tide the ships are reaching and the low tide they come out. Exactly the same technology we are using for Calcutta now. And when sea level was higher, think of it, many of the today's river must, may not be there. Yeah. So even we have the British period records, although Matthew is mentioned that it is navigable up to this point. See, British period, when you say records, uh, it goes back to a few hundred years. 
what I talk, I didn't talk anything if you see here after 2000 years. Reason is, uh, I may be presenting and you all may get impressed with it. But the hard fact is, still we need to work hard on it because for this period we, we have very few points. Okay, I remember uh, first time when I published this curve for Geological Society of India when it came back from uh, referee, they say that you, you have very few points, so we, if you, those who have seen that curve, we put it the dotted lines. After that, we said that we got few more points, so then I made all this still, and which they, they have published afterwards. So the British poor, I am not the right person to answer, because I didn't, to, latest information which we are yet to publish is 1000. Something around 1,000 to 1,100 years before <laughs> present, probably sea level, probably. And you cannot quote me because it is not published. About one to two meter lower than today. If it was lower, but it's present level, it has, again sea level has gone up. We, actually, it looks so simple, but uh, because I, pre I was presenting to non-geologists. Mm -hmm. When I presented to the geologist, I expect much more question. No. Then I say that, why can't you all come forward and contribute to by putting more points on it? When Dr. Rajguru first time published, he was having only three or four points. For that, he was describing 15,000 years. Now we have so many points. I have not shown the point, but if you see the original paper, because for presentation that was not required, but publication, what we did, we have collected all the dates which were so far published and we applied the correction. I will tell you how. You got a fauna which is indicating say 5 meter water depth. You got a fauna, you said it is shallow water fauna. You got a date of say 8,000 years. Now sea level will be not be that level which is in the core. You have to add 5 meter to it. Then you will come to the surface of the sea. So those type of correction we applied to all the published dates. And then we summarize this sea level curve. And we, re if you see the title of my first paper on sea level, it says it is an update. We have not claimed we are the original worker on it. We updated and we keep updating. If you see down, uh, to th so first time we published it, I think around 1900, in uh, S.R. Rao's book on Dwarka. That was the first time when I put a, a almost a straight line on sea level curve. Then we started putting, summarizing. So 1995, first time, then 2002 we published, 2012 we updated, 2024 now recently we talked. Again, we are going to revise it. And East Coast, no sea level, uh, credible sea level curve for entire Holocene was there. Shailesh Naik, who got uh, uh, Padamshri yesterday, uh, he, when he was with Ministry of Water Science, whenever he was coming to NIO, he was saying, Raji, why can't you publish something for East Coast? So, uh, finally we published in 2019 on East Coast. And you were asking about tectonics. The best, best example of, just minute, the best example of tectonics is the Myanmar coast. Myanmar coast, what, at the same time, what we get on East and West Coast at 100 meter, you go to Myanmar coast, you get 120 meter. So from where this 20 meter came? How to explain it? There is a trench. So along the Myanmar coast, this is a hard signature of tectonic sea level. The bottom of the sea is going down. And in last 10,000 years, 20 meters. You can see the speed. Yes, sir. Uh, so, I mean, uh, discussions are getting hard, but food is getting cold. Okay. <laughs> No, no, just a uh, last question. Okay. Now, mine is specific to rock art of Goa. G? Uh, okay, specific sure. uh, reference to rock art of Goa. Yeah. 30 years back, there is a technical report by the NIO, hmm. uh, specifically on Uzga Limul. Hmm. Uh, when uh, Desa was the director and Vora was the hmm. heading the marine archaeology, yeah. and Gore was there, I was also part of the team. Hmm. Now, they made two conclusions. One, uh, around 300, 3500 BP, that is 1500 BC, mm. 
there was a change from wet to dry climate. Yeah. So uh, that's one thing, whether that, that position remains now or it has changed over, over the period of time uh, through your research. One. Secondly, they also said there was a shift from dry to wet during 9000 uh, BP. That is around, uh, say, 7000 BC. Now, with regard to the, the uh, later date, that is uh, 3500 BP, it's, we all archaeologists will be comfortable uh, with regard to that, what, uh, say, 1500 BC. We are comfortable with that for the megalithic dating. Say, we all, you know, agree generally that megaliths can be dated to around 1000 BC. Uh, now, in that case, the whether the rock art can be dated to 1000, around 1000 BC in Rock Goa, one. Now, along the coast of Goa, we are getting Mesolithic sites. Okay. It's, uh, um, Sali has done long back. He has got the, you know, uh, Mesolithic sites, and I got uh, Mesoliths uh, along the coast. So, if we push that, then it goes to uh, around 7000 BC. So whether these dates have remained uh, same now or through research that their dates have changed? See, for, first thing, I must admit the limitation of our archaeology people. <coughs> Initial years, other than Rao, who was concentrating on only the offshore cities like Pumphar and the Dwarka. The other three members of archaeological, uh, marine archaeology division, they were, see, these sites were well known. So have they discovered those sites? No. I'm asking you. Which site? That uh, the site which you are Bolgali. mentioning. Yeah. And now people have not discovered those sites. No. Then what they have done? No, they are not supposed to do Okay, neither they have discovered those sites, nor they explain those sites. This, they say you people got your quoting about uh, warm and humid to warm and arid, that type of climatic variation. All those interpretations borrowed from a paper by Nair and Hashmi in Indian Journal of Marine Sciences in 1980. You again go back to that paper. If you want, I can send you that paper. I have with me. Karatini also. Yeah. So all these climatic changes, uh, very see, whenever sea level was lower, like 3,500 BP, we geologists call, in, we don't use BC. We always call before present. 3,500, it was little cooler climate. Cooler climate was there. Around 10,000 from warm and humid to warm and arid, it got changed. So whenever the sea level going up and down, same question he has also asked. So I'm not commenting because I have not worked on that. But I'm telling you as a reference, Nair and Hashmi's paper in IJMS, our archaeology, see, same thing, Gopika, Patnam, and our people reported about 30, 20, 30 years back. P.P. Shirodka reported 50 years back. These people have gone and again reconfirmed, just yes, there is a wall. Till we start, we geologists start poking our nose. Okay, now we know that what is the story of Gopika Patnam and that wall. Otherwise, these people have not done anything. Neither they discover nor they explain. And they have no authority to talk on climate because they didn't get any artifacts there. You, have you got any artifact there? Other than the no, engraving, no. They, they so climate, climate research comes only when you take a core sample. Sur climate on surface sediment, you cannot interpret. You want to go in time, you have to collect a core sample. It, the core sample can be on the river bank side, if there are sediments depositing. You can go to the lake sediments, if any lake is around. Or you go to the marine side and collect a core. So what we talked about climate, we almost in a second, my, every second paper is on climate and sea level. So, uh, and, but micro level climate, we could not say, if you ask, even monsoon, what we publish is resolution is only 10 years. That is the maximum. Because you cannot slice this marine sediment less than half a centimeter. Now that half centimeter deposited in how many years? If it is shallow water, you get 10 years. You go to deep sea, one centimeter might have deposited in 1,000 years. So that uh, you see then Nair and Hashmi's paper, that, that will be fine. So if no more questions, I, I must thank you. Uh,
Tejas ji, um, you have exposed me to a new place of learning and uh, this time you ask me, now, this time I am requesting you, next time when you arrange, uh, I will be very keen to join you. Who knows that? And please pursue this dating of in course. potholes. You, you may hit a jackpot. Of course. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your enriching our knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Now it is, I mean, time for break. Before that, we have to wind up. So we'll gather three o'clock here once again.
Thank you so much for your uh, uh, great opportunity to this thing. Since we are talking about the uh, series of cupules are getting every field in everywhere, and uh, it is one of that I have been excavated in Tamil Nadu, and uh, for the first time in years I we got uh, license for this excavation in Tamil Nadu, particularly Maliadi Patti in uh, Pudukkottai district. Okay. So before that, I have to start my brief thing about the rock art and everything. I need not to go for in detail. Next, please. Okay. Just I'm skipping all these things. Yeah. Recently, in Nagpur, rock art study unit is established. It's a brainchild of our former DG. Dr. K.K. Bas uh, Professor K.K. Ba K. K. Basa, sir. So he initiated that and it was inaugurated in Nagpur and it was, and it was attached with the uh, pre uh, priest branch, Nagpur, since I'm holding the charge of that. And uh, since our uh, main purpose for all these things means uh, our uh, uh, project main observation is the exploration of the less explored and potential area for systematic documentation of rock art site in India, for development of database of on rock art uh, in India. Apart from that, scientific dating of rock art in India in collaboration with scientific departments in India. Mm -hmm. Likewise, we are having our motos. And apart from that, identification of the important potential rock art sites for centrally protection and conducting a national and international seminars and workshops on uh, workshop on rock art of india and preparation of publication of an uh, encyclopedia of rock art sites in india so likewise we are having all these motos so we have to start this uh, work as soon as possible again it it is begin now and uh, Based on that only recently, I had went to uh, Murgesh uh, site in uh, Udupi district and it was wonderful uh, uh, bruising and some uh, cupils are, I, uh, I mean, examined the things. So totally we have in ASI 10 protected rock art, uh, rock art sites in India, entire India and uh, our Arun Malik has been exhibit the all uh, sites in uh, exhibition in outside this campus and uh, better you can go and see those things and uh, we have to uh, doing uh, work on it and these are the few uh, Orissa sites and again we are getting cupils in Orissa and some bruising uh, art, uh, uh, art. And this is, everybody knew this thing, World Heritage Site, Bimbetika. <clears throat> so I need not to take more time because uh, forcibly I have been standing over here. Uh, that's why I have to uh, safeguard your other uh, talkers, I mean, time. And uh, this is Jasi in UP and uh, Chaturbhuj Na uh, Nala in MP, so all this, uh, and Raipur, Chhattisgarh area, uh, 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 shelters. So this is my topic now. So it is a, a, a rock art cupil site in Tamil Nadu, particularly Malayadi Patti. Just behind the our protected monument, this site is located. So when it was, it's a, it's a chance discovery, I can say now. In 2009, I went for some uh, uh, quarry operation is going on within our 
monument uh, premises. So during that moment, so I have been, I mean, explored this site. And apart from that, within the, uh, this site, we have some Jaina bed also. Already it was, uh, I mean, protected by the, our department. And most of the cupils are getting the uh, cave number one. It, this is cave number one. Based on that, we proposed this site for excavation. And uh, uh, during our course of excavation, we got statigraphically uh, hammer stones of this, I mean, site. And apart from that, cave number two, we get a white pigment of paintings, birds, and some sort of uh, question mark it is in a female or something, fertility cult or uh, uh, figure. And uh, and uh, the cupils in painting also we got it this site. So this is the proposed site for excavation and layout of cave. So this is the inner view of the cave you can see here. It's in the plan and it is in the point. <coughs> the most of the cupils are get in linear pattern. So it was excavated in 2010. So sometimes we get the, some vertical marks also over here. And it is very interesting thing. So each and everything we have been systematically documented over here. So cave number two, again, the same uh, painting where, I mean, uh, uh, discovered this uh, shelter. So likewise, bird figurines, again, this is cave number one. We get a linear pattern cupils, and the same pattern pigment will get in the cave number two, that white pigment. So this is a very interesting thing. And cave number two and cave number one, we're getting plenty of the microliths. Based on that, we have been taking in a foothill of this uh, site, uh, a small trench we have been uh, opened, and we get the stratigraphically so many and uh, uh, microliths we got it. So these are the objects we got during the, our uh, excavation. So now you can see the wall. This is wall, uh, eastern wall, 170 cupils are getting. Each and everything properly, systematically numbered and it was measured by systematically by Jesse Kaldeka Hoga Shayad हम लोगों ने इस चीज को कहां सीखा है अपने डॉ प्रोफेसर गिरराज कुमार जी के साथ ही रहने के बाद ताकि इस साइट को खोजने का श्रेय ऐसा जाता है ताकि व्हेन आई वाज इन आगरा आई वाज एसोसिएटेड विद रॉक आर्ट ऑफ रॉक आर्ट सोसाइटी ऑफ गिरराज कुमार सो दैट्स व्हाई ड्यूरिंग आवर कोर्स ऑफ सम इंटरनेशनल आई मीन सेमिनार सो आई एम पार्ट एंड पार्शल ऑफ दैट टीम and again we went for OSL dating at Dharki Chattan. Ye dekhne se Dharki Chattan ka site bhi aisa hi shelter mein mile hai aur ye bhi isi prakar shelter mein is cup mask ko paaya gaya hai. Now you can see. So yaha pe interesting thing is that ye pedestal jaysa hai iske upar aapne ye khada bolne ke baad yaha tak chhoo sakta hai. Aur iske upar hum logon ko nahi mile ga. It shows that the cupils made that when I mean, one man can be access, unko kaha tak chune ka possibility hai, shakti hai, wahi taki kar sakta hai. To is prakar, is ka ek khasiyat hai, is cupils ka. So this is western wall. It is containing 268 cupils. A different size and different, different pattern cupils are, I mean, documented over here. So again, I came to the, uh, recently, last week only I visited uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Murugeshi site in Udupi, Avalakki Pare. The same significance, uh, last three, uh, three days we are, I mean, uh, visiting the site, the same, I mean, uh, 
sort of bruising and some uh, geo uh, clips are getting the things. So I want to, my eager interest that I have to start the initiator, uh, the, my uh, unit, that's why I have, I have visited this site. So you can see here, same man was, I mean, uh, on the uh, plan itself. And even though during that the moment we get some sort of tools also. So already morning you have been observed all these things. I need not to take more time. So यहाँ पे ये आदमी को सुलाने के बाद इसी प्रकार की प्रकार के मिलेगा वो ताकि इस जिस figure के ऊपर उसको एक imaginary एक thing एक create किया है हम लोगों ने यहाँ पे यहाँ पे देख सकते हैं क्या नहीं सी बहुत I mean thing तो इस प्रकार इनकी हो सकता है किस प्रकार इन्होंने बनाया होगा एक imaginary creations है एक तो इसी प्रकार एक documentation किया हम लोगों ने now you can see both figures and as well as that man and apart from that cupels are here we have to see lot of possibilities were here to get more evidence on associated materials मिलने का यहाँ पे और भी इसको आगे हम लोग investigation करना है यहाँ इस साइट को भी और इसी प्रकार की क्यूपिल जैसे उन्होंने कहा है गेम्स मैन ये हर एक अलग अलग पीरियड में अलग 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 क्यूपिल्स बने होंगे उसी प्रकार अभी हिस्टोरिकल पीरियड में बहुत सारे इस तरह के क्यूपिल्स मिलेंगे बहुत सारे लोगों को कंफ्यूजन है कि ये सारा चीज हिस्टोरिकली हो सकता है लेट भी हो सकता है इसी प्रकार हम लोगों को जब तक हम लोगों को कोई क्लियर कट एविडेंस नहीं मिलेगा तब तक हम लोग कुछ नहीं कह सकते वेर इट विल बी स्टैंड एंड कल मैंने भी मिस्टर पाटिल सचिन पाटिल से बात कर रहा था ताकि उन लोगों को ये भी इसी प्रकार की क्यूपिल्स मिले हैं महाराष्ट्र में बहुत सारे तो यहाँ पे सो ये क्यूपिल के बारे में डिटेल जानकारी लेना बहुत जरूरी है और ये है बुद्धन जुडो वेर सम जियो क्लिप्स एंड पेट्रो क्लिप्स आर आई मीन गेटिंग ओवर हियर इट इज ऑल्सो डॉक्टर मुर्गेश साइट इट इज और यहाँ पे आपको जो चैरियट जैसे बता सॉरी बुलक कार्ड उन्होंने कल सुबह मॉर्निंग डिपेक्ट किया बोला उन्होंने ताकि अभी रिसेंटली सरनोली में इसी प्रकार का एक चैरियट मिला है तो मैंने जैसे देखते ही मैंने उनको बोला और मंजुल सर को भी बताया मैंने इस बात को सर इस प्रकार के एक मिल रहा है उन्होंने कहा हाँ रॉकेट में तो होता ही है लेकिन देख लीजिए करके उनके लिए भी भेजा मैंने इस चीज़ को भी तो उसका भी रूबरू इसी प्रकार का प्लान वगैरह है वो प्लान में दिखता है ऐसा ही सो सम ऑफ द ब्रूसिंग इन बुद्ध न जेडो और यहाँ पे इतना डिपॉजिट है स्टिल वी हैव टू एक्सकेवेट दिस थिंग और भी काम करने का स्कोप ज़्यादा है यहाँ पे करने से बहुत कुछ मिलने का पॉसिबिलिटी भी है सो दीज आर द माई ऑब्जर्वेशन वेन आई विजिटेड दिस साइट तो जब मेरा साइट जब एक्सकेवेशन हो रहा था जब प्रोफेसर सुंदरा सर भी आए थे सिंस ही इज माई गुरु एंड ही केम टू मी एंड ही एडवाइज मी लॉट ऑफ थिंग एंड बेस्ड ऑन दैट ये मलिया डिपट्टी साइट के साथ हम लोगों को एक मेगालिथिक क्वारी साइट भी मिला है तो मोस्ट ऑफ दी यहाँ पे जितने भी एविडेंस मिले हैं हम लोगों को एक कैन सर्कल के ऊपर कप मार्स मिला उस कप मार्स रिलेशन में हम लोगों ने काफ़ी कोशिश किया क्या क्या मिल सकता है इस एरिया में और वो एक मेगालिथिक क्वारी साइट है उस साइट से कैरी आउट करने का पूरा डॉक्यूमेंटेशन भी किया है हम लोगों ने इट्स अ वंडरफुल एविडेंस इन द इन दिस साइट एंड मोस्ट ऑफ द थिंग्स वॉट आई एम आई मीन सेइंग दैट पर्टिकुलर इन मलयाडी पट्टी द साइट मस्ट प्रोबेबली इट इज मैगेलिथिक और हो सकता है डेट को अभी स्टडी करने का बहुत स्कोप है स्टिल वी हैव टू थिंक ऑन दैट पार्ट थैंक यू सो मच और दूसरी बात सॉरी यहाँ पे कर्नाटक में एक हाथी मिला जैसे मैं मोहन से मोहन डिस्कवर दिस साइट इन मोहन विच साइट इज इट आई थिंक नियर मस्की 
गल्लागुड नियर मस्की एंड जैसे हम लोगों ने कल हाथी देखा था तो उसी ने भी हम लोगों को ऐसा लगा था कि और भी इसके बारे में जानकारी लेने की बहुत ज़रूरी है और उसकी एसोसिएशन में क्या मिल रहा है एसोसिएशन क्या हो रहा है कहाँ जा रहा है और भी डिटेल एक्सप्लोरेशन करने का और एक्सकवेशन करने का पॉसिबिलिटी रहा है तो कर सकते हैं जैसे इस साइड की जो है देखने से दोनों रू का रूबरू एक ही प्रकार है यहाँ पर देखा गया तो ये देखिए और लोग भी अलग से डिपेक्ट लाइन लाइन ड्राॅइंग्स है यहाँ पर वो नहीं है बस ये जियो क्लिप्स में सो वी हैव टू थिंक ऑन दैट पार्ट सारा साइट का भी यही ऑब्जर्वेशन है मेरा ताकि और सारा एक्सप्लोरेशन करके वी हैव टू गेट द क्लियर कट एविडेंस फॉर दिस थिंग इट इज माई ओपिनियन एंड अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट मोस्ट ऑफ द क्यूपिल्स आर गेटिंग ओवर हेयर वॉट इज द कोर रिलेशन बिटवीन दिस जियो क्लिप्स एंड क्यूपिल्स वी हैव टू स्टडी दैट प्रॉपरली जैसे हमने कल देखा जहाँ पे देखने से कह रहे हैं वो यानी कि शेर का पंजा जैसा लग रहा है सर इसलिए हम लोगों ने ठीक है जो भी लगे वी हैव टू उसका को रिलेशन करना बहुत जरूरी है सो वी कैन नॉट कंक्लूड द थिंग एट दन वन स्टेज थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू फॉर दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी giving me this opportunity to sharing my opinion on this part and uh, particularly do teen din se hum log lagatar yahan pe uh, papers dekh rahe hain as well as site visit kar rahe hain ye sara dekhne ke baad yahan pe jo clips ki detailed survey hona hai documentation hona hai drawing documentation hona hai sath mein aur exploration mein aur bhi kya milne ka possibility hai dekhna hai jaise humne एक जहाँ पे बड़ा हाथी मिला था और कोलीग मिस्टर अरुण मलिक सब वन सॉर्ट ऑफ सीरीज ऑफ ब्लॉक्स वो जो इसमें पड़ा रहा यानी कि यानी कि ब्लॉक्स है जैसे हम लोग जैसे अभी चॉकलेट देखते हैं ना जैसे स्लाइस जैसे बने हैं वैसा ही रूबरू स्लाइस बना हो वो किस कि, किसी लिए बना है किसी को पता नहीं चला शायद आपने देखा होगा नहीं देखा होगा फिर भी थोड़ा उसके बारे में गौर करिए सो वी मे गेट लॉट ऑफ एविडेंस फॉर दी सपोर्टिंग दिस जियो क्लिप्स दिस इज माय ओपिनियन थैंक यू सो मच Thank you so much, uh, Shri Mulimani, for conducting this, uh, giving us this presentation. Uh, I would like to call Dr. Garge to please felicitate our speakers and moderator. I request Dr. Garge to first felicitate Dr. Mohana R. professor murugeshi <laughs> professor avi korisata
Professor Ajit Kumar. In cave number two, we have this simple pedestal which does not have any kind of molding. Then in cave number nine, we have the molded pedestal. The pattern of this pedestal are very corroborative to the, the pedestals found in the early phase of the Brahmanical caves. Those are noticed at Badami, those are noticed at early caves at Elora, and also we can compare this pattern of the molding with the cave at Elephanta and Jogeshwari. Okay, uh, cave number one, this is just a number. Uh, having this theory anthropomorphic figure, the half human and half serpent, and having the serpent hood, Difficult to identify it, we have not came on any conclusion. This is very interesting image of the Keval Narsia, which is very similar to the images of Keval Narsia found in the Kovar Wakataka domain, okay, in the Vidarbha region, especially at Ramtek and other sites. I think uh, episode of the Kaliya Daman or the Krishna's childhood stories uh, are seen in Maharashtra in early dates, especially in the Wakataka period in the 4th, 5th century CE. This was begin into the rocket cave. But as an independent panel, first time observed at Katar Gaudavade, where the special credit has been given to the Kaliya Daman. Now we will discuss that why this episode must have been selected to depict at Katar Gaudavade. And image to the cave number four, we have this huge image of Shesha Vishnu. In every respect, this is very unique because we do not find such a kind of Shesha image which is reported at Udaigiri or Shesha Vishnu image reported at Pavanar or the Shesha Vishnu image, Im image reported from Mahabalipuram during the Pallava period. Now you could find here the Vishnu is reclining having the two hands, but you would find it is following the narration where the, the demon Madhuya and Kaitab are attacking over the Vishnu and you would find that the Yoga Maya who came to invoke the Vishnu to save the, the Vedic scriptures, and you would know that how this episode turned into the killing of the Madhuya and Kaitab by the Vishnu. Okay? Now, uh, generally, we do find Madhuya and Kaitab in Shesha Vishnu, but here at Katavga Zavade, the additional feature is the Yoga Maya, whose role is important for the invocation of the Vishnu, and first time reported at Katavga Zavade. And if you compare the length of this image, that also is extensive as compared to the Shesha Vishnu image found at Udaigiri and other caves. Okay, this is general view. Okay. The details of Shesha Vishnu image. Okay, at cave number six, we have the image of Karthik here. Now, there was uh, issues. When did the uh, imagery of the Karthik was introduced in Deccan or South India? Okay. So, if you do compare the early images of the Karthik here, we can notice that this could be earliest evidence of the Karthik found in Konkan region as compared to the other examples of the Kartika reported elsewhere. And here at Kathalagadwadi, it has assigned uh, an independent shrine to it. Okay? That also we need to notice. Okay? And alongside of the image of Kartika, we have two flanking images. Possibly those are uh, the other forms of Kartika itself. Can be of the Shakh or Vishak, which we do find in the uh, uh, forms of the uh, early image of the Kartika. This is again a massive image, uh, the life size image of the Vishnu holding the, all his uh, attributes. Uh, Chakra is there, Shankar is there. Even the position of the holding the attributes also is very peculiar that we don't find these kinds of the feature in the classical Gupta art also. Okay. So this we can notice at Katar okay. You can see the illustration of this. And to surviving this kind of feature in lateral stone is also is surprising. Okay. So these are the details of the attribute. And generally, there is a norm or there is a notion that uh, we do not find the depiction of the lotus prior to the fifth century CE. And in case of the images of the Vishnu found at Satavul and Katargao, we don't find the lotus held by the Vishnu. Okay. So this is the one of the important sign to date these images. Okay. Cave number seven. The image found at cave number eight is very significant. Okay, earlier we thought that it could be of the Brahma. Then 
when we have closely observed, we had noticed that it has two layers of the head. Okay? If you do accept that two layer of the head, then it could be of the image of Maha Sadashi, okay, which earlier reported from the Mandal excavation. Okay? Eight-headed image of Shiva. Okay? And that same feature we could notice, the image found at Katargao Zawade. Similar attributes also we can found in this image, where the image probably was holding the danda in his left hand, and the right hand he's holding the kamandalu. The same feature we do find at Mandal images. Okay? And other iconographic feature also goes parallel to the image found at Ma Mandal because these images are stout. Okay? They are small comparatively and do suggest that what kind of the artistic phenomena was existing in the early centuries of the iconographic period of Deccan region. Okay, now in cave number 9, it has the narrative scene of the Ganga Uttar, the descent of the Ganga. We know that the earliest depiction of the descent of the Ganga in Deccan is found at Ayodhya, which is reported. Then we have the episode of the descent of Ganga found at Elephanta. Then we have the descent of the Ganga episode found at Mahabalipuram. Now these are all dated based on inscription, like Ravanfadi cave at Ayodhya can be dated to the mid of 6th century C. Elephanta can be dated to the mid of 6th century C. And the Mahabalipuram can be dated to the 7th century C. In comparison to the, all these three sites, Kathargao Zawade could be the early example where the whole narrative is shown into the detail, okay, with the sequence wise, okay. And some additional feature also you could find, those are an indicator of the archaic nature of the narration of Ganga Uttaran episode found into the Deccan region, okay. Now here in this image you can see uh, the Shivayan Parvati is riding on bull which is connected to the, the main theme of the episode. Now you can see in the corner is a Bhagirath who is in penance. Then Shiva appeared, and over the head of the Shiva, having the three heads of the goddess Ganga, who came with the three stream to came down on the earth, where the Shiva have unlocked his jata and Ganga have merged into the jata of the Shiva and then flow down to the earth. Okay. So this you can see how the features can be seen. Okay. Interesting. This illustration. Okay, these are just to compare how this theme must have been went into the down of Deccan region. I heard, and then it goes on. Then at Kathalga Zawade, uh, there is a locality too where there is a place of Bharadi Devi. Locally, this place calls as a Bharadi Devi, which has the earliest depiction of Saptamatrika of this region. Okay. I think this is interesting and because this place having the one squatting female image which could be again can be correlated with the cult of fertility that was existing or coming down from the uh, early period. Okay. Uh, then in locality 3 they are also having the excavation alongside of the there is one collapse stone slab which locally calls as the Maher Vashiniza Dagad. In Kokan it is a popular tradition. Uh, at various places, you do find these kinds of the phenomena. Okay, okay this is about, uh, in general, about Katharga Zawade, what kind of the iconographic evidence is there, and these are survived in later right, that's the most important part. Uh, alongside of these cave excavation and the iconography, over the uh, laterite surface, having the petroglyphs, okay, or the geoglyphs, what term you are using. Okay. It's just a general observation about the Katargao Zawade, what kind of the peculiar feature we can see there. Okay, then at Nudi, we have this cave, like, which shows the successive phase of the rocket cave architecture in the Kumkan region. Now, this cave, as per its general feature, goes close to the early rocket cave found into the Karnataka region in early Chalukyan period, especially Ravan Fadi. Then we can compare this cave with the uh, early Jain cave found at Ayodhya, okay. especially the, the column and the pattern of the pedestal and the shivaling. Okay. Okay, now this is a cave complex at Pangri Budruk where there is a rocket excavation as well as the monolith shrine. Okay. Now here we have the, uh, the excavated facade and that may have been used for the wooden extension in front of it. Okay. 
Now, these kinds of the caves are found into the Tamil Nadu region during early Sera, early uh, Pandian period. Okay? Even in Kerala also, we do find this kind of figure. Uh, this is only right? Okay, now in this cave complex, uh, having the pedestal along the polished shivling. Okay, now this is different stone as basic I know about the stone pattern. And you could find it has polish and having the Brahma Sutra. Okay? Now, similar kind of phenomena we could notice uh, the cave site at Arevala and Goa. So, this shows the close affinity to it. Vanuguli okay? is having the three. Uh, monolith excavation does show some indirect connection to the Shaiva tradition. Okay. So this is shrine number one. This is uh, back profile of the monolith shrine one, having the excavated pedestal with the ancient Shivalinga. Uh, this monolith shrine number two. Okay. This is in general how uh, the rock cut cave phenomena are found into the Konkan region which shows the, the pattern of the iconography, which shows the, some kind of the new beginning into the religious landscape of the Konkan region, as well as it does show that these kinds of the activity probably was begin from the hinterland and subsequently it went to the shore, seashore area, okay? And where the grand excavations were started, like excavation we have at Jogeshwari and the excavation like Elephanta. Second, we also did have noticed that uh, in case of the Katargao Zawde, the, uh, the rivulet, small rivulet, uh, Likisa Zara, which go down and merge into the Satoli. And uh, it starts with the image of Vishnu and it ends with the image of Vishnu. That kind of the connection also we could notice how this must have been introduced in the Konkan region, especially the, the phenomena that has later began a grand phenomena in the Deccan, especially the Shaiva phenomena and the Vaishnava phenomena. And we do find that after 6th century C, the entire landscape was occupied by the Shaiva tradition, by the excavation like Elora. Elora is the grand exhibition of the, the same thing. And probably this could have been the humble beginning, okay, which later exponent into the extensive form where you do find the political patronage, you do find the inscription related to the, all these caves and you do find that how the people were moving towards the Shaiva tradition and the Vaishnava tradition. It's interesting. So on this stage, I would like to thank to the authority of Deccan College. I would like to thank Director of Archaeology Museums, State of Maharashtra, Managers of Katar Gaon Zawade, Satoli, Pangri Budru. I would like to thank to Sikhan Janvi, Dr. Sikhan Pradhan, Diman Darbi, he was with us in our third, first uh, documentation tour. Then Sushant Ambokar, who had prepared excellent drawing, Pranit Polekar and Priya Velinda. So thank you very much. If there are questions, queries, would like to address it. Uh, thank uh, you. So this is the right stage to propose something. Would like to request Dr. Tejas Gerge kindly protect this site. These are nationally important sites because we do not find these kinds of the uh, early cave in the Deccan region, especially in Konkan, especially where you would find has giving the different dynamic to the religious history. So that's interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gopal, for giving us a wonderful description of rock art, early rock art cut caves in the Konkan region. Now, uh, I will ask, request to put a question to Mr. Gopal. Sir. Dr. Gopal Goke, you always come out with very interesting papers and I'm a great fan Sorry. of your presentation. Sorry, sir, I'm not doctor. <laughs> no, it's okay. Now, tell me one thing, what period do you date this? Uh, uh, we have dated... No, this image. This image we have dated 4th century. 4th century? Yeah. Basis? Uh, this is stylistic feature, uh, the maze pattern, the chakra pattern, especially which is shown in hurling pattern, which is quite early. Then the conch pattern, the kind of the position held. Okay. okay. In and south, basically, they would say that uh, if the chakra is held in this fashion, yeah. they say that it is later. 
and in early sculptures especially pallava period ones it is shown from uh, as yes, a disc yes yes, yes. Uh, so this they say is later so that's one one point i would like to just point out i don't know what is the feature another thing you uh, pointed out was about uh, that um, reclining vishnu yes uh, yes and you said about a devi concept Ma yoga maya where is that can i have a look at yes. it yoga maya And in the sculpture, how is it shown? Is, it any, is there any clarity in the sculpture? Hands are raised and she is in position to do <coughs> And it goes parallel to the story that we do from in Bhagavad Purana and the Harivansha Purana. Okay. And uh, that sculpture of uh, Kartike, which shows, it matches with the one, one you Founded notice in Odegiri, Odegiri and uh, yes, Gupta yes. ones and you notice. This also shows, likewise. But that concept of that, um, that, uh, ma, uh, that uh, her waking up Vishnu is not seen elsewhere, I think. It's not a very popular thing, is it? Yeah, that's why. That's, uh, that's why this is again indicator of the early stage of this depiction. Because I've not seen it in South India, that no. particular concept. And no. that no. Part, the, the person there at the corner with that gada in the hand? They are to Madhuaya They are marching to Madhuaya Okay. Yes. And here you don't have that um, uh, uh, navel from where yes. Brahma... Where is it? Brahma sitting on a lotus from the na emerging from the navel. Is that there? Here is the Brahma. Achha. Both Brahma Yoga Maya. Okay. Both Brahma Yoga Maya is with raised hand. Okay. Congratulations for the interesting paper. Thank you, sir. I think these are very interesting because we have very few caves in laterite in this area. And like you said, rightly said, it needs protection, I guess. Uh, another criteria that we have taken for the editing the Vishnu image is the elongated crown. Kirito Mukul. Crown. Uh, yeah. That we do see in the Gupta iconography or the early Gupta iconography. Which is a attribute such a large, you know, yeah. distance of... Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. From Gupta yes, Bay, yes. Gupta region to down up to... But uh, perhaps it does have some connection with the, when the Tarikutakas were emerged in the coastal region and they took the title as a Param Bhagavat and uh, oh, sorry yeah Param Bhagavat and that could have been some having some indirect relation to the beginning of Vaishnava tradition in the Kumkhand region. Okay, normally we associate Vish, um, you know, Kadambas with... Yeah in South Kung, Kadambas that also we have taken into consideration then probably it was Tarikutakas, either Tarikutakas or the Mauryas, who were just there beginning their political There is one in Goa also, which is in Latin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are what is the comparative this thing, elements with this uh, one? Which you show? Are they Arevalam could be the later, later period, later period later than this. these caves, yeah. Yeah, that's a Chalukit inscription, sir. Depth, depth, depth. Depth is one meter here. Yeah. No, actually when this was uh, clear, na, that time we have taken the depth. Now there is a filling in front of it. It was buried, yeah, it was buried actually. Sir, uh, one question yes, yes. to my question. Uh, you have shown one uh, pedestal shivlinga. Yes. Sir, which was height of pedestal shivlinga? Height? Height, height, height of shivlinga. Height of shivlinga. Pangre Budruka or Katargao? Uh, next, which was polished, which was polished. Yeah, okay. so one, one and, and half, half, half feet. Half feet. Yeah. Sir, so stone is laterite or? Uh, that's yeah, why I'm asking. Polished, it's polished. It's, it's polished. polished. No Thank doubt, you. it's polished. Shivalinga, the linga is not laterite. The pedestal is laterite. Pedestal is laterite. Yeah, it's polished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Um, Gopal. Here, here, near. Say holding in one finger or two finger. No, it's and not in one finger actually. Yeah, sometimes there. Yeah, this. Yeah. 
This is like in hurling position. No, no. You should, no. Usually shown holding yeah, in yeah, one yeah. finger or two fingers in straight portion, not yes, flat. Yes. And we always say that the one where this is held, uh, um, showing the full wheel, it's later. Yeah. Always later. Um, yeah. You reconsider that. This is okay. And uh, in the same belt in Goa, you have not only Arvelam. Uh, earlier to that, there are caves, for example, Shigao. Mm -hmm. And in on the way between Ponda and Panjim, there were some caves, and in the hi highway expansion, it has gone. Similar caves were there, but Shikong still exists with a uh, image of uh, lion, seated lion inside. Only lion, there is no god inside. Only seated lion in the main pedestal. We have dated it to 4th century AD. Uh, this is one. And the polished linga may not be uh, contemporary, might have been brought at a later date from somewhere and installed. Uh, possibility is there. Possibility is there. Arvelam is, of course, a bit late, later than this all. Anyway, good one, good presentation. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. Next question. Yes, please. There are few caves in which no deity is there, nothing is there, just rectangular thing. Can it be a shelter for geographic figures caved around? Because this point we are always discussing where these artists were living. So can it be so? Possibility is there. If there is no any artistic feature, then it's difficult to assign its period. Okay? Since at Katal Gaos we have images, we have other decorative features. Based on it, we can date it relatively to compare with the other sites. If you have only excavation in that case, it would be difficult to date it. Another thing I just wanted to ask. The, the height of the pedestal mm -hmm. uh, where the Shivalinka is installed mm -hmm. seems to be higher. Yeah. In, in the caves which we have to see in Kerala and other places, the, uh, the pedestal is rather low in early caves. Okay. Okay. So it is only after 8th uh, century or so the pedestal rises right on the mm -hmm. floor as well. Mm -hmm. Here the pedestal are actually quite elevated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So again the question of whether all <coughs> these belong to the same period of time is one question. Uh, yeah, need to be there. Need to be there. Yes. Yes. Because uh, one of the uh, pedestals you showed uh, looks like uh, uh, eighth or ninth century Valipita in our temple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that yeah. appears to be. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But I did follow the pattern that has been uh, discussed by the Sondar Rajan. Uh, okay. So that pattern I did have followed. That, that pedestal is a structural work or a rock cut? Rock cut one. Whereas Shivalinga is a loose one and the pedestal is rocket. Uh, it's not unique. We can take it as unifit. Because we do find uh, what is this. Unifit and again, <coughs> that, that extension should, should be there. Uh, yeah. Where actually when Abhishek type yes. of worship was there, that tube comes up, that unit part comes. But that is also a later addition. Yeah, yeah. It is not here. Yeah, that means it is early. Uh, we do not know if that, uh, like he said, that uh, the stone linga was installed at a later time. There was some other thing which was kept, like in uh, caves in Palava period. The uh, basically the pitha remains empty even now in few. Only that uh, the same fluted come. So whether some image was worshipped on that pedestal in timber form, because yes. stone was associated with uh, megalithic monuments. So it, there was not a much of a popularity till um, Chalukyas came and installed, uh, started installing these. For Pangre Budruk, we did not follow the caves from Kerala region. Yes, no, to, no to I'm detail. talking about the caves with yeah. the images come only rather during mm -hmm. Chalukya period that they break the traditions or mm -hmm. uh, inhibitions of using stone for uh, temples mm -hmm. and uh, rock cut, I mean, Shivalinga and the Palava monuments, you know, is that, uh, that um, yeah. uh, what is it? Um, Vishnu, uh, sorry, Shiva with Kamli, mm -hmm. what is that uh, image known as? The backward. And the, uh, the pedestal where the Linga is supposed to be there, it's vacant. Any other questions? Uh, sorry. So just a quick one. Uh, there is a geoglyph at Katarga Zaude also, right? Yes, it is. Uh, how that far is it from the scale complex? Around of 30 meter, 30, 40 meter. That's it. Very close. I mean, close. same vicinity. I think that is close to the Bharati Devi locality too. 
ओके लोकलिटेड ओके थैंक यू just like to make an kind of a, a comment or an appeal similar to the geoglyphs public petroglyphs that we are still in the stage of collecting more and more data exploring more and more uh, geoglyph sites and documenting them various patterns similarly mainly thanks to dr anjay dhanavde now we are trying to find more and more such sites be it cave sites or be it monolithic shrines Uh, subsequent to Katra Gaon Zaude, Pangore Butro, and all, uh, Anja has explored many more sites, and this entire data needs to be collected and collated to see the pattern, and the entire phenomenon or a premise or hypothesis that the rocket excavations at Elora, where essentially the influence came or the inspiration came from the South Indian region, and here we are seeing an indigenous tradition of monolithic shrines. which could have developed into a big uh, huge structures like elora so that's the premise on which we are working right now and we are trying to collect more and more data uh, that data needs to be again as i said needs to be collected collated and then interpreted this is just some early steps that we are taking in this direction thank you so thank you everybody any other questions thank you abhijit uh, sir what does contemporary literature talk about nothing nothing okay na no. shaivism or vaishnavism or other the prevalence and then the literature are there patronage um, difficult to say anything no difficult to say the dynasty that's i told that trikutaka could may have some relation because they were the one who took the uh, title as a param bhagavat and then we do find the moryas uh, also have took the title reconcent to the shaivism donations donor like uh, uh, sir uh, we need to look at is in the context of the buddhist uh, patronage and you juxtapose this with the buddhist patronage uh, this region had a very rich tradition of huge uh, buddhist caves with patronage and then suddenly you have very humble beginning here over here that probably means that there is some interplay between the brahmanical uh, practices and buddhism which was very dominant in this region so the natural the patronage would go to buddhism and they are starting an independent humble beginning this could be a phenomenon we don't know but we are also looking at it from this point of view what were the conclusions to you such a select such a still i have no idea this baffles us absolutely anyway thank you gopal and abhijit and my best wishes for your future field works and now we will be playing one short video uh, video message rather from dr ana Mar ana maria ana maria the please play the video here is kali sir please pause and raise volume the geogaze of Kanka. It is for me a pleasure and a great honor to represent Dr. Maria Reich, who, is, who was the leader of the Nazca Lines and the keeper of this fantastic Yes, yeah, show me, please. Uh, well, Ana Maria uh, works with the Peruvian uh, geoglyphs. Uh, she had a very interesting presentation to share at an IIC event. That's where I met her. She works with the Maria uh, Reich Foundation. Maria was the first person who actually spotted the geoglyphs and brought it into. public purview and started like a movement and anna trained under her and uh, now she's doing uh, close spectrum research and looking at even the smallest of details and one of the very interesting project that she's carrying out is she's collating data on all the geoglyphs around the world and 
there is a pattern. There is a pattern with respect to all the geoglyphs around the world, and pattern in terms of where it's located, its climatic distribution, the kind of themes. So unless we have everything under the same umbrella, it's a little difficult to compare. That's all about Anna. And she couldn't make it, so she left just a video message. Dearest colleagues, sir and madams, thank you so much to invite me to this important international conference on the geographies of Konkan. It is for me a pleasure and a great honor to represent Dr. Maria Reich, who, is, who was the leader of the Nazca Lives and the keeper of this fantastic, marvelous place full of geoglyphs and lines. We have 75,300 in 85 hectares full of these marvelous designs that you will appreciate it in the videos. I would love to invite you all to come to Peru soon because this year we have the privilege to have 30 years that the lines and geoglyphs are declared World Heritage Culture or World Heritage Sites. It is for me a pleasure to work on a program that hopefully I will try to get it and done before December of the 14th, that it's the day that it was declared. Well heritage culture, well heritage sites. I will make the program and you will know about it through a Peruvian and very important person in India who loves your culture, as I do. And he is, is the ambassador Javier Pavlovich. And so he, through him, you will know exactly our program. Thank you so much. I think this is the moment that we all have to be together. All these countries it has so many geoglyphs, and some of them geoglyphs in lines. I think it is a must that we have to keep them, preserve them, investigate them, to know their past, especially for the future generations to know exactly that we have to conservate them, to know better the past. And through the education and the knowledge of all in each of one of us, we need to work with education and also to let them understand that we have to keep them forever for the future generations. We might have the idea to sign a paper, a very important paper. So we all the countries that has lines and geoglyphs, we have to be united. We must be united in help of those who really have to have helped to make them a good conservation in proposals so they can come and investigate in every country so we can know exactly what are the meanings no matter no matter what country no matter how far we must be united this is one of the most important tasks that all of us have to sign because we have the privilege to have them for me, I embrace you all and thank you so much because also you have a wonderful, wonderful country that I love. Thank you very much and I hope to see you very soon. Thank you. Namaste.
I am the fortunate person to visit Nazca lines as well as Machu Picchu, not once, three times. And again, fourth time I am going in this May and June. So if anybody wants, because I have contacts there, if anyone of you want to go there, I can certainly help to go there and arrange everything there. I have good contacts there. And if you want to know something more after this session, you can personally meet and I can tell you something, whatever I understand. Basically, I am not archaeologist, so I am engineer. So whatever I understand that I can explain to you. Thank you. All right, let me rephrase. This was supposed to be international conference along with Robert Bendrick, Erwin Neumeyer, and uh, her, all of them together. Uh, but for some practical reasons, they could not be here. But it seems in heart, she was with us. And what she said is very important. We should feel privileged because we have them beautiful that really touched me and I wish uh, everybody in this country who is running who are running bureaucratic lines and who are uh, our political master they also share the same feeling so I hope we carry this forward and I learned many of our friends are not here tomorrow uh, in our validity section so in welcome, I casually welcome my friends from ASI. But I think it is also my former duty to thank them. On one call, Arun Malik came running to moderate the session. And Ramesh Mulevani, since he was heading a newly found rock art chapter of Archaeological Survey of India, he was also here for moderation. And uh, Otaji is still, I mean, uh, ASI man in heart. <laughs> so, he said, I don't want to end with my review, come validatory remarks, there should be a separate paper. So, we heard him extensively over Ladakh. It was beautiful, it was wonderful. And, you know, I, I remember my own days of uh, being assistant archaeologists who are basically running behind the screens and shows who are almost invisible in all tasks. And uh, some of you might have experienced that phase of mind too. So I definitely acknowledge Shilpa, Sharad and Sham from Archaeological Survey of India, Nagpur, who worked hard together to put those exhibits that we see outside. So thank you very much to them. <laughs> thank you, Arun Malik, for bringing all that exhibition here. And thank you for being with us. And you know, my unfortunately our friend from Mumbai Circle could not be here. I wish ASI takes lead uh, to declare some of these as nationally protected monuments. The Kashari you visited yesterday, I think it, it has far more wider reach than beyond being a state protected monument. All right, we are doing our bit and I think it is high time ASI also takes lead and declares some of these as nationally protected monument. And that would be a true acknowledgement of the existence. So I hope this conference takes, uh, gives some inputs to ASI. Even I'll speak to DG personally. And let us see if we could do something together. Well, now we come to the end of uh, today's session. Uh, let me announce uh, uh, I'm sorry, am I missing somebody? Namja Ajahn sir is always there and he is not going to go tomorrow. He is going to be with us till the end. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so and uh, well, uh, today let me announce that after our uh, dinner there is a cultural program so please join us and let us bring uh, felicitations of this session on
when it's 9:30 i uh, what dinner no 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 cultural program it is at 10 o'clock sir so what time do you go to sleep <laughs> you want to make it early <laughs> please it let me know right so sir uh, uh, down below sir you just have to walk a few te- steps below where we take dinner there's a stage uh, which we haven't seen yet but yesterday you might be listening uh, to some, so so we'll be going there <coughs> well let's bring it on I invite Dr. Garge to please felicitate our speakers and moderators for the session. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. S. B. Ota first. <laughs> Professor Giriraj Kumar. Gopal Zoge and Dr. Abhijit Dandegar. And the moderator for the session, Sri Arun Malik. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we'll be winding up for the day. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be beginning with the final session of the conference at 9.30. Thank you. We'll be dispersing for the day.